One minute. Good morning. I'd like to call our um, monthly work session for June 15th, 2021 to, uh, to order. Uh, first up is our Financial Advisory Committee with uh, Pam Truitt and Mitzi Cochran. Good morning. Chair Brown and members of the school board, how are you this morning? Pam Truitt, I'm uh, the new chair of um, the Financial Advisory Committee. It's on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you very much. So let me start over. Uh, Pam Truitt, new chair of the Financial Advisory Committee. It's a pleasure to be here. It has been more than two years since our uh, re annual report to the board has been made. So uh, a lot of changes to new school board members, a new superintendent, uh, a new attorney. So it uh, might take a little longer than we have in the past going through the report, although you're quite familiar with uh, most of the information in the report. So first I'd like to just introduce, we also have uh, new members of the Financial Advisory Committee. I know you approved them, but I'd just like to, uh, we just wanted to put them on, uh, included in our report, so uh, you would know if you see them out somewhere to recognize that they are now uh, on the Financial Advisory Committee and just, you know, if you don't know them, say hello to them. We also have lost four members, <laughs> so we uh, kind of ended up uh, where we started. Uh, John Craner, big shoes to fill. He was a wonderful chair of, of this committee for many years. He, he's been the chair since I've been on it. Uh, has left the committee now. Um, Murray Bluegrass also was on the committee for quite a while, and I think he just his health issues just became uh, more than he could uh, felt like he could contribute. Dan DeLeo, of course, his firm is now the school board attorneys, <coughs> conflict of interest there. And Gabriel Hammond, I understand he has ex been accepted to law school and is relocating. So do want to thank John Craner again. He's been a terrific chair and uh, I've learned a lot from him, but I still have quite a bit, uh, big shoes to fill. So our report, uh, we tried to focus on kind of three areas, and they are educational quality, financial management, and then operating capital. 
budget. And I think it's important for us to review um, what our key roles are because sometimes we get confused ourselves about what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And we are oversight. Um, oversight of the sales tax and the voted millage. And that's what the uh, referendum says, that we are oversight. <clears throat> we also do um, financial condition monitoring, evaluation of budget and spending. And I'll tell you, we do it from the 10,000 foot level. We do not get down in the weeds. Um, we look at uh, good business practices, and we think the school board has done a really good job of that. And then a couple things I would just mention would be the um, self-insurance. That was a very wise move on your part to do that. We're sounding board. If you ask us to do something, we'll take it on if we feel like we have the skill set. And one of the things you've, you have asked us about is uh, impact fees. You've also asked us to review the, the self-insurance. Pam. Mm -hmm. And then... Pam. Uh, Yes. You know, talking about what your role is at, at the FSBA meeting last uh, week, there was a speaker that talked about the 10 rules of uh, effective boardsmanship. And um, they talked about, you know, rather than getting in the weeds, put your arms around it rather than your fingers in it. And also to um, look at outcomes more than the details going in and in and I think that's something that you guys have grasped. That's what you are. Um, you're going to be looking at the outcomes and at the bigger picture. And I appreciate that. Because so, <laughs> so, sometimes, as you know, they, everyone wants to run things. And I appreciate you giving us this unbiased look at what we're doing. Well, and thank deep. you. <laughs> and we do. And lastly, and this is, I think, is the key is, um, you know, what do we get for what we spend? And that, that's the key, and that, that, you know, that question can be answered a lot of different ways. On the next slide, I, I know that you're very much aware of this, that 80% of the funding for our school district comes locally, including the millage rate, which is 10% of the income and for just over 14% of the operating budget, and then 21% comes from the state and the federal government. On the next slide, the impact of the voted millage and sales tax is a bar chart, which I, again, I know that you are very familiar with, um, that shows the, the, uh, uh, the rise of the millage over time. Th this bar chart starts from 2015 and goes through 2021. And you can see that in 2015, the millage brought in 48 million and some change, and this year it's 66 million and some change. So we're, we're talking about a substantial amount. In terms of the quarter of the 1% sales tax, uh, that <clears throat> stays pretty um, level. Uh, it, there's not a wide variation in that. <clears throat> this year there's a slight dip, and I know that that uh, had projected to be quite a bit worse than it is, but, but just in terms of, uh, you know, consumer spending in the pandemic. On the next slide, we will get into, uh, we'll start uh, educational quality. Uh, these numbers are all 2019. As you know, there was no testing and no school grades in 2020. So there's really kind of been no, no change there. Um, but what a privilege it is to say that we continue to be in a district with 83% uh, of our elementary schools in A, B, 100% of our middle schools or high schools, A, B, and then 89% of our combination schools are A or B, and they would be uh, you know, Pine View, Laurel, Nokomis. There may some, be some others that I'm not familiar with. And then the 2019 Florida Standards assessment for English lights, sorry, English language arts scores were number three in the state, and that's something to be quite proud of. Uh, page nine of the presentation is an overview of the um, reading and math scores for our district, comparing us to the state of Florida beginning in 2006. And as you can see, and again, these are 2019 scores, uh, 2020, there was no testing. You can see that we have tracked higher than the state in reading and math uh, since uh, 2006. On the next page, we kind of drill down a little bit. <clears throat> uh, reading and English language arts, um, 
for our district and comparing us to the state. And, and this comparison is really 2010 to 2019, so it's nearly a decade, and there have been gains in every demographic group, but I will say that there's still some achievement gaps in some populations, which I know you're aware of, but if you look at the black uh, population, the Hispanic population, there's still some achievement gaps to be, to be some improvements to be made. And that is exactly what you'll see on the next page, page 11, in educational quality. There have definitely been gains since 2010 in every population, but still some improvements to be made in the achievement gap in some populations. On page 12, uh, SAT scores, 20% of the, uh, our students take SAT scores. Mitzi, is that? Uh, also, the 20% is that about, about statewide average, or do you know? I, I don't know. Okay. So, uh, in the SAT scores, when you compare us to the state, we're six, about 65 points better than with the than the average of uh, students across the state of Florida, which is significant. <clears throat> when you compare us nationally, we're just about level. So you can see the footnote at the bottom that the number of students who took it, not including the charter schools, was about 20% of our population, student population. And then uh, page 13 is just, uh, it drills down uh, SAT scores, compares it to uh, the national, the state, and the district. And you know, the last two years we've been about, about the same, and 2017 and 20. 18, we were significantly higher. Um, not sure exactly what drove that, but we seem um, uh, to be uh, considering that our students went through a, sort of a trying learning uh, in their senior year, junior and senior year. I don't think there's a significant drop in SAT scores. Page 14, graduation and drop off rates. Uh, dropout rates. I understand that um, that these numbers are what they are. Uh, without testing, it's difficult to say whether some students would have passed or not. And so I'm not. Sh it's not clear to me that these numbers are realistic, but they are what's been reported. And I really don't see, in terms of graduation rates, there there's an increase. Uh, on graduation rates from 2019 to 2020 in our district. Uh, and dropout rates, we are a little higher than the state, which I think is a concern. I'm not, again, I'm not, it's not clear to me what's driving that. And the dropout rates are 2019, so we haven't, uh, or you haven't received the 2020 dropout rates yet. Those dropout rates were concerning to me, too. Um, back in the 90s when I was in the legislature, I saw that when we looked at the state of Florida, we were one of the highest dropout rates. Um, and what they did to respond to that is they set stronger limits, like you had to have a C or better for it to count, the D's didn't count for credits, but also that Florida had the highest credit hours needed to graduate than any other state. And I was surprised when I came on the board to find out that Sarasota and many areas had even higher credit requirements than the state did. Um, I'm remiss in not following up on that, but perhaps that's something the uh, superintendent could look into. Um, I know that the, um, I believe the IB and the, um, a, some of the programs require more credits to graduate. Um, but, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I question that the state had higher gra graduation requirements than the rest of the country, except for, I think it was Mississippi or Alabama. Um, but I was then even more perplexed that Sarasota had even higher graduation requirements than that. And if you could look into that and get back to us on that, I'd appreciate it. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's all right. Thank you. And then in summary, I would say that uh, our school district is ranked third in English language, art, language arts among Florida's 67 school districts. We're ranked fifth in mathematics 
fourth in science, and then we are, you know, one of the one of the two school districts. I believe St. John's is the only other school district um, that has received an A rating every year since the state started grading. And so I think that that's certainly something to be proud of. And if you'd like, I can stop now if you have any questions before we go on. I have a question. Jane. Um, thank you. Um, Pam, I, I know that you have a lot of new board members. Uh, and that is good and that's bad because they don't really or haven't been involved in this effort before. What are you doing to make sure that they have some training? Uh, obtaining them to their desk. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you'll see on our priorities, we're doing uh, orientation. And, and the, the, when I came on the Financial Advisory Committee, I had the benefit of a very robust orientation, which greatly helped me. This time we're doing it, we're doing a little bit of orientation each meeting, so it'll take a little longer, but we're gonna cover, say, uh, you know, Mitzi did a really good job of the budget uh, at our last meeting, and our next meeting, which will be in August, will be Sunshine Law, and so we're gonna be, so it makes our meetings go a little slower because it's more training and not knowledge and information, more questions to get our new members up to speed. And I know some of those Board members have been coming in through Zoom and so forth, but yes. I would just encourage them starting in August to come in in person and get to feel the energy in the room and get to know each other. Yeah, Thank and you. I hope we can do that. Thank you. Um, I was going over your your numbers and 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 um, my comments are on page ten and some of the other ones. Um, while we did have increases from 2010 to 2019, and there is that learning gap, I did see that while this, the um, overall we increased by 12 points, um, the white population increased by 10 points, the black population by 16, and the Hispanic by 17, and free and reduced lunch actually went down. Um, so, I mean, I think that shows that we are making um, efforts to reduce that that achievement gap and we're not doing it by lowering the top because the top has still increased I mean from white kids from 63 to 73 percent and I think there were similar ones and in fact even better in math um, we had a 22 percent increase uh, for black students and 21 percent for Hispanics and and whites increased by 12 percent of course they went from 65 to 77 um, but there's still that gap but we have to continue to more than double the increase on our minority students to come up uh, to that. And then on page 12, when you were looking at those SAT scores, um, I was concerned, not just when I looked at the math that we were behind, but when I look at where Florida is on the math compared to the rest of the nation, Florida is 44 points below the national average on the SAT scores for math. And I'm like, yeah, I guess maybe we didn't have the right math book six years ago or something, and uh, or we weren't following through something because, but I think that's something that, you know, we might want to bring up to the state, like, what are you doing or what did we do wrong? And maybe what, what, what are we doing better than what we did? Um, and I, too, saw how, and, and on page 13, on the SAT scores were, <coughs> for some reason, in 2017 and 2018, everybody jumped. I mean, especially Sarasota. So we must have had some really bright kids in those two years graduating or, or in there. Um, um, and But then afterwards, it's, it's stayed pretty level. And so I appreciate mm -hmm. you bringing those numbers to us because we often get them and they're all mixed up with all these other things. This is the down and dirty, the bottom line. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you um, realize that too. I, they probably gave you what they were in third grade, fifth grade, fourth grade, and the bottom line is, is where we need to look. Um, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, with the SAT piece, um, <clears throat> the numbers that, that we have here in the booklet that we're looking at, those are, uh, those are students who did not take the essay part as well. And there's two different, with the SAT, you have the students who take the essay part and then other students who do not. And this shows 
those who did not. When you look at the population of our students uh, who did take the essay part, in mathematics, uh, Sarasota is 45 points above the state of Florida and 47 points above the national average. Wow. Yeah. So, well, so you looked up on that after I talked to you yesterday. Well, yeah, yeah, I would like that. Um, so I need to give that to you as well. But that's the So it was the, the whether they use the essay or not, huh? Um, you know, there's the students. There's two groups of students, ones who, who did take the essay with their uh, SAT and then others that did not. So, well, so I guess we so encourage well. those to take the essay. I'm, I'm, thank you for looking that up for me. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Dr. Asplin. I, I would say um, to your comments about the gains uh, in certain populations, certainly there have been gains. But as uh, when I look at, say, in 2019, let's just talk about the black population. There's still more than 50 percent of the students that are below the acceptable le level. And then I will also say that if the achievement gap was easy to solve, you would have done it. Okay, so it's tough. So I, I, the whole community appreciates what you're doing. It's tough. So yes, but I'm glad we're 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 more than increasing the overall one because we do have to put some focus on there. And and thank you for right. looking at that and pointing it out. Jane, so did the, you have another comment? Um, the um, the comment the comment that I was going to make is that. Uh, uh, the SAT and the ACT are less important in other states. Uh, many states today are not using those assessments to get into college. They're using more the four years and the volunteers and the essay that people write for college. So I don't know if, all, if Florida will follow suit so far. They have not, but that is an important, it is an important assessment tool for us, but as far as getting in college, it is becoming less and less important. Any other comments from any other board members? Uh, Ms. Ziegler? I just wanted to thank you because <clears throat> I think it's really important that the community understand that this is a voluntary position that you guys put in, many who have served for a long time, such as yourself. And on, yes, it's indi it's indicated in, our, in the language for the referendum, but it takes a lot of hard work and commitment. And so I just I want to share my appreciation for you and all of the members of the Financial Advisory Committee for, for taking this on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Karen? Uh, yes, I'd like to echo that and uh, thank you as well as the Financial Advisory Committee and uh, recognize the work that you're doing and how you've broken it down, very much appreciated, as well as recognizing our um, school staff and our district staff for bringing up those scores and um, would really like to celebrate that growth and uh, use it to challenge us to continue the mission. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next uh, two pages really are, th this is uh, for those who have seen these reports in the past, we added the, the uh, dashboard, both the student achievement and the financial transparency. And um, some of you might know that we use this report basically when we do presentations to groups, okay? We, it could be bonafide based on what group we're talking to, but many people will ask us, well, where do you get this information or that information? And honestly, we, we don't always know those answers. So do, uh, so by adding this, it, it will help us know and be able to guide people we're talking to about how to get information. Because I know you put a lot of work into this, and I think the community m may, may not know about it. So we just added that. and. It, Explaining it to other people will help me understand it as well. So then on page 18, we get into our economic considerations, and this is really what we look at as sort of the pie chart. How are the funds allocated? And, and you know, and that's really the investment the community uh, makes by approving the millage every four years and you as the school board makes by policy. And so we look at that investment, the first, the first, uh, line, 60, nearly 63% of the budget, I would just put a 603 positions in these categories that are not, that are no longer supported by the state. And I think that's huge. And I will say that on the times that I have given presentations, uh, when the referendum is up for renewal, the, the, um, 
the, the individual schools and those positions listed are pow is powerful information for people to hear because you just don't think about that. Half day longer for students. I don't uh, know what the hours are. It's uh, about 20% of uh, the budget, but if you were to add those up by the students over time, you'd see a significant increase in, lear in learning gains opportunities. Uh, program enhancement, and <clears throat> Mitzi and I have been kind of <laughs> round and round. What is that? <laughs> But it's uh, extra days that the that, that teachers work that they wouldn't be paid for normally. And then charter school financial support, as you well know, is just a pass-through. And the summer learning academies is a relatively new category. It's a small amount, but um, uh, it, uh, th the program seems to be well-suited for referendum dollars. And uh, we, were, uh, we had a conversation about that at our committee. We were happy to see that was included a couple of years ago. And then page 19, again, you're familiar with this, but it is uh, just tracking over time the unassigned reserve position. A few years ago, there was some concern it was going to dip below an acceptable amount. You made some changes to that. But, uh, as I understand it, every fund has its own reserve account. So in some respects, it was double counting. And so the policy was changed. And uh, now you're in a, a strong position again, 15% reserves. Capital investments, the use of certificates of participation has been and continues to be prudent and productive. The school district continues to enjoy a very strong bond rating, double A, double A minus, and uh, <clears throat> large A, small A three. Uh, you have reinstated the impact fees, and I understand that uh, you're getting ready to update the report to support those. Uh, total capital investments to schools between 2007 and 2020, 1.36 billion. And there were, that includes, uh, school-wide uh, uh, safety improvements and HVAC improvements, and then individual schools, Riverview, Woodland, Venice High, Atwater, Booker High, Sarasota High, and then to both the North and South Suncoast Technical College and then the Suncoast Polytechnical High School. Those are huge investments. Page 21, charter school impact. There's really not much to say about this because charter schools, the, the number has stabilized at 15%. I know there's one new one coming online this year, the Dreamers Academy. But as you can see, all the way back to 2015, it hasn't changed much. And then the return on investment. This is where we talk about what we get for what we pay for. The investments, additional instruction time, reduced guidance counselor ratios, increased school campus security monitors, class size compliance, technology tools and support. We maintain the art and music programs. And our returns are our FSA performance is high, even with curriculum changes and higher accountability standards. We are an A district. We have a, a super, super majority, really, of A-B schools. Our SAT scores are considerably higher than state. Our graduation r rates, dropout rates, you know, those are small, small changes in those. So is there an absolute proof? No, there's not. But there's a strong linkage, and, and we really don't want to have to prove the negative case. Could we get along without the funds? And then in summary, um, we're ranked one of the best districts in the state. Uh, average annual investment since 2002 is $50 million, all in operations. Decision to maintain strong reserves have provided critical funding cushion. Flexible financing has funded needed capital projects. And over 86% of the total operating expenditures devoted to people costs when excluding the charter school pass-through payments. Then on page 24, there's a number of uh, priorities uh, for our committee this year uh, that actually might take us a couple of years to get through these, but if 
what I'd like to do is just go through them and then come back and really talk about number one, which is uh, to suggest a procedure for use of the referendum funds. But and what, we'll come back to that one. Impact fees, uh, we, we hope you'll ask us to be involved in the updating of the impact fee process. I think our committee has a skill set for that. Uh, competitive salaries, we could, that there's a review coming. Yeah. Uh, evaluation of program investments such as summer learning academies. Uh, if uh, you, you, Some of you may remember that we had iReady on here, but actually we removed it this year because we're not, we don't have the skill set to know anything about iReady. <laughs> and so uh, we'll be happy if you don't ask us to do anything about that. <laughs> and then uh, periodic review of the bond ratings investments. PFM does come to our committee every year for a presentation. And then to Mrs. Goodwin's point, orientation for our new financial advisory committee members. So uh, back to number one, um, over the, uh, past year as we look at the budget um, <clears throat> we, uh, we 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 began to wonder if we knew how things were put added to the budget that were supported by the referendum dollars and, and conversely how things were removed Mitzi told us that in the past it has just been done by the superintendent and that it really wasn't a procedure not a lot of board involvement and so it feels like there should be some transparency around there. What's your thought process? What procedure do you go through? Um, how does that occur? So uh, I don't have a specific mode in mind, except there needs, uh, at least from the Financial Advisory Committee report perspective, some transparency about how that occurs, uh, we feel is needed. So questions? Well, um, Jane? Well, I too, it's been magic. Things got on the budget, um, got in from the budget, got on the list for the referendum. I think it was magic. Uh, because we never had any discussions at the board table. Uh, and I go back to before I was on the board when I was involved with the referendum and I'm thinking about the recession, that we wonderful recession we had in 2007, 2008. And that was a time that we put a lot of things in play because we really needed those things and we had no other way of paying for them. So I would like to see us at, at if if you will, clean up what's on there. We want our the transparency of our community uh, to understand how important these dollars are, but the kinds of things that they do for us, like summer learning. If we get back to that next year, hopefully, uh, those kinds of things are, are impactful to the school district, but I, I think that uh, we might look at that more closely, not today, but I agree with Pam that we need to um, uh, to take a look at, at, uh, at that and, and uh, maybe make some decisions uh, at the board table. Um, Bridget? Yes, thank you. Um, I would agree with Mrs. Goodwin. I think, um, I think it would be good to highlight that. I think especially particularly as we complete our strategic plan, maybe waiting until that's concluded so that the additional refer the referendum funds are, are really tailored to what the goals we highlight as a district, which kind of going to Mrs. Brown's point was really where our role is, is you know putting our arms around our, our big picture stuff. And so that may kind of coincide with that. I would hate for you guys to do additional, unless you come up with kind of your process, but I would hate for, I love the idea by the way, but I would hate for you guys to go down that road and then we do our strategic plan, which unless the superintendent tells me otherwise, we're expecting to be concluded by August. So, um, and I, but I think that would be an appropriate place where we see, okay, how is this going? And I do agree with the process that the board certainly should have some weighing in. And I think it uh, elevates the transparency piece of it. So people really do understand the impact that the referendum does. So I love the idea. And, and thank you, Mrs. Ziegler. And let me be, be clear. We don't want to develop a procedure or policy because we don't know enough. <laughs> Uh, we want, you know, we th it seems like to me it's something that the board would want to undertake. Okay, rem remember, we're at 10,000 feet. Yeah, I would Sometimes think Sometimes higher. <laughs> this is something that um, the, um, our, our, our finance department can work out with the superintendent and bring to us and look at it. Um, uh, Karen? 
yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Truett. I fully uh, agree with the recommendation. I think that we approaching the importance of the uh, referendum that transparency is um, a priority for me. Um, and I think it will help us be wiser uh, as a, a collective set of skills coming to this board and uh, giving the community opportunities to have input as well as staff. Um, in addition to that, I would like to see or have validation do we currently have on our uh, website an actual list of each item that the uh, referendum is paying for versus the, the categories that were in this presentation. Do we have a, a, a dollar figure for, uh, okay. and that's on our webpage? It's in the budget. It's an entire addendum in the budget for the referendum. Okay, because I see that on our uh, webpage there is a, a separate category for the referendum that isn't um, separate from financial reports. And I think if, if that information was available with the referendum information, it might be uh, easier for community members and um, comprehensively across the community to access it and give us feedback that, uh, that we've asked for relative to um, our strategic plan and moving forward. My individual input, not speaking for the board, of course. Good morning. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that um, in the budget every year, we do include um, the started back with Al Widener, the, how the referendum spent. And in addition, we do a report for each individual school. So we can just make sure those are published and put on the website separate from the actual budget document. Yeah, and I think we can work with communications department and make sure that this is available on the website, this report from the Financial Advisory Committee mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the information that um, we're getting from the Finance Committee on how we're spending it so that it's they don't have to go through the whole budget to find it, that it's easy, and uh, thank you, yeah. Karen. And I think we're all getting nodded. Yes, we, well, we think it, that's a good idea. But what I hear um, Mrs. Corcoran saying is that we're looking at a dollar-for-dollar dollar, uh, transparency with each individual school, and for any community member to go through the number of schools that we have, I would, as an individual board member, I would be interested in having that as a collective document where someone wasn't having to go through um, 50 different uh, reports. Um, I think it would be ideal from, again, my individual perspective. Does that exist on our page? Yes, yes. We, that's what's in the budget is the collective for the okay. district as a whole. And then we do produce a report usually every four years that shows each individual school and what is the referendum dollars are paying for for each school because for many they're more interested in what is my school community getting instead of how it is overall with the okay. district so we excellent. do both thank you very okay. much excellent yeah and, and i see our communications man back there taking notes so um <laughs> and other board members nodding so i think it will be done um tom so, having had that big conversation about communications, um, I wanted to chime in and say thank you because I think part of what you bring to the table is uh, as stakeholders of the community, you're bringing a perspective and a communication that we should step up in a couple of different areas to make sure, and you even use the phrase yourself, um, I don't think the community knows about this. So. That's a big level that we want to make sure gets communicated to the strategic plan. But along with that, what is really important is that you highlighted from the community perspective the, all of the issues that are important and our accomplishments, which are often unsung. So I, I, I wanted to make sure that the thank you that I provide is specific to those particular issues and also what is invaluable to me is one last perspective of uh, the priorities and the recommendations. We get it in loads of, of uh, data on an ongoing basis, but you really cut right to what we should be looking at and what the community is interested in. So thank you for uh, the conversation that the board had today. Thank you. 
Um, I wanted to point out on, on page 20, you were talking about the capital investment and the use of COPS funding. Um, I know that was, I don't know anybody was on the board at the time, um, but that was a controversial issue, whether or not we should use uh, the certificate of participation bonds at a time when we were going through a recession or a regression, I don't know what we called it, <laughs> but uh, we, we were having financial problems. And, you know, when I pointed out that this is one way that we as a government body, the school board, has a way of reaching out and helping our community, keeping those businesses that are important to us, that we need these businesses to continue because we use them, but also it was a way to keep um, you know people in our community working when so many were being laid off. So that was a win, plus we got all these things, done. but it came in at a much lower cost than what we expected so that we were able to add Sarasota High School onto this list that wasn't there. We were able to start the South County. It was amazing how much lower those costs dropped at a time. So to me, that was a win, 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 win proposition by having those, using those funds. And uh, the Booker High, I'm not sure if you were saying that these were all COPS funding, but the Booker High was from those federal funds. I forgot what it was called at the time. Stimulus. Stim okay, <laughs> stimulus. But it was some sort of no interest or they were paying us back for the interest, something like that. So it didn't cost us anything to borrow those dollars, um, which was, a, I think, a good thing. And I know when you're out there talking to people um, you, to add some of that in, if, in fact, you get blowback about borrowing money. Um, and the fund reserve that you talk about, oftentimes, when we're putting the budget together, people are very concerned because we're getting very close to the limit, the seven and a half limit on the fund reserve. But what happens every year, we have to budget for what we expect or what we look at today, what it's going to cost. But uh, throughout the year, uh, the finance department and I think all of our departments work to make sure that we can come in under budget. So we're you know, we, we do the budget and we're coming in at 7.7% at .7 or 8% or on our reserve and people are concerned we're so close to that reserve. Um, but then at the end of the year, um, we always end up in the 10 or higher percent. And, and that just happens to be the way, and I'm getting a nod from Mitzi, this is the way we have to budget. We have to budget at what we, the highest expectance that we expect. We can't budget in what we propose as our savings because we're not sure what those are yet. The uh, last page on your report under prior, and it's the last priorities I'd like to talk about a little bit. And okay, that and is, I haven't gone over it, but so go I'll ahead. I'll let you go over that right now then. Okay, the, the, um, we typically go to community groups, business groups, uh, when the referendum is up for vote. Um, and so, uh, and these are typically the groups that we go to. We'll go to any group that, you know, that you request us to go to, or we get a request to go to through, through the school district. Um, but um, this is our, sort of our boilerplate uh, template. And then, um, and, and again, we, uh, so we only we only communicate with them over you know once every four years about specific issues and we give them it, we provide we don't give we provide various information we take any questions and honestly if we don't have the answer and, and we're not going to always have the answer it depends on who's doing the presentation um, you know we'll get back to them. Uh, the role of the financial advisory committee not everyone on the financial advisory committee. Uh, will wants to do the presentations they're not comfortable doing them you know as you well know this year we have four new members we have lost four members uh, i asked mr craner if he would come back and help do some presentations with me uh, he said he would i'm going to try to hold his feet to the fire <laughs> but um so so i will leave it at that and mrs brown um, well, th th that's the thing too. Are you invited, or do you reach out to these groups? And is it to 
tell them about it, the referendum? It, it's uh, it's sort of a combination. Uh, some requests come from the um, Citizens for Better Schools. Some requests come from the school uh, administration. Mitzi's office will say somebody called the Meadows Community Association called. They wanted to know if you are going to come. Sometimes we reach out. If we haven't heard from a particular group that we typically go through, we'll reach out. Uh, do you want us to come and make a presentation? Yeah, I, I would add like the Realtor Association, political and, clubs, yes. and Junior League, maybe some of these others. Um, and 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 I would think I would speak for most of the board members. If you if you need backup support, you know we're there for you. Uh, we'll come with you if you need it. The superintendent. I mean, we're there. But um, there's discussion on whether we should have this uh, referendum in March or, and well, it would be a presidential primary if we moved it. I mean, do you feel that that might be a, uh, it, it's easier to reach these groups, you know, in the spring uh, versus, you know, if, I don't know how you'd reach them all in. Well, the voting starts, I think, in September for the uh, November elections, for the early voting and things like that. Um, do you have anything about, you know, how it might be harder to reach them or easier to reach them? Or you just... You know, our, our committee hasn't talked about that in years. And so um, I would only be giving you my opinion, which I think there's pros and cons. Thank you. Um, Jane? Thank you. Um, this year, we're talking about not doing it at the presidential election. We're talking about doing it next March, which will be a special election. And we know that the county has a uh, one cent sales tax on the ballot in November, so it would be a conflict, really, to have both of those at the same time. If it's moved, we're looking at moving it to the 2024 uh, time frame, and I think that will be determined um, at a later date. I don't want to confuse people by thinking this is not going to happen when it is. Um, but um, we will be hoping to put some stakeholders together, several committees together, as we've done in the past, and, um, and reaching out to organizations. If there are places that you know that people can speak, you'll have the opportunity to let us know. The superintendent will be out all the time. Aren't you happy about that? Because he's our star. So um, the superintendent will be there. Um, Pam has done this many times and a great job. Thank you, Pam, for stepping up to the plate to be the chair of this. I, I know we all really appreciate it. Uh, but uh, we're in the process of organizing. We should do some organizational things this summer, and then we'll get started right after school starts with some committee meetings and that sort of thing. If there are people that you know that would like to be a part of this, please uh, let us know, let me know, um, and uh, you know we'll go forward with this uh, for the what the sixth time. Is this the sixth? Yep. Maybe. I, I, I thought I'm it was thinking. the fifth, but last time was the fifth, right? I'm, we, we're having time. so much fun. So this will be the sixth time that I have, and the last, I might add. I will be moving on after that to uh, some other place and some other things, watching birds with Pam, and she's doing photography or something. But at any rate, uh, I, I just think it's a, an exciting time. All of this information is great for our citizens. All of this information is important. I see the arts being the biggest, one of the biggest pieces of this. One of the things that dis really is different about our school district is the, the longer day, and now it's becoming other districts have copied that and have used our philosophy, but the longer day is good, but the arts integration is really important. So um, thank you, Pam, and we look forward to um, working on this. Uh, and uh, anybody have any suggestions? You know, we're all open. Yeah. Any final questions for me? I, I see nobody's uh, uh, the thing clicked, but I, I too would like to thank you and your organization. I mean, your, your, your board, I know they do a lot of work and, and, it, and it isn't just those few hours you spend. You've got to get a lot of work done beforehand. As, as we do normally too. <laughs> and, um, and I also appreciate uh, the work from our, our financial committee. Mitzi, and that you do providing the information for them, and um, we'll do what we can to get you perhaps in a in a better way of of.
training new 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 people and you can uh, give us some input on some of those things that we should do that's going to work better for the future yeah thank you and i i also want to give a shout out to missy and her team especially lisa uh you know we couldn't do this without them and and they present the information so that as lay people we can understand it they're very good about answering questions um if they don't know they'll go back and and get the information so uh, it's been a pleasure to work with mitzi and her team and dr asplin as well look, look forward to working more with you Th thank right. you thank you very thank you much. very much thank you pam all right <clears throat> Appreciate that update, and uh, thank you very much, Pam. Appreciate that, and, and Mitzi, thank you. Uh, the next item is new legislation. Do we have Ron the face on the line? Yes. All right. So, um, Ron, are you there? Oh, there you are. <laughs> We're here. Megan and I are both here. Yes, sir. All right. Good. Good. Thank you, Ron and Megan, for being here today. Um, I know that. Uh, that as bills pass and the governor signs them, um, you know, we get more and more information. And uh, I will say that there have been a couple of documents that have come come forward. For instance, FADS, I know they wrote a document. And then uh, um, FSBA has a document as well that, uh, that was very good uh, at the end of uh, the paragraphs of each of the of the bills were action items and they're bulleted. And that really helps us quite a bit, especially when we are having to create new policy or put information in our pupil progression plan and so on and so forth. So, um, so I did include both of those, I believe in your packets, board members, just so you have that. I know it's quite a bit of information, but it's uh, different associations uh, writing it in different ways. And uh, that's very, very helpful. So with that, Ron, I'd like to turn it over to you. I've given you 60 minutes. So not sure how much of that time you're going to need, but if you could, uh, you know, just go over uh, some of the bills for us, we'd appreciate that. And if you could tell us yeah. where you're talking from, if in fact you're talking from one of the reports. So I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, we won't be talking from from either of the reports. Okay. What we've done is put together a, um, a a separate doc, and basically what this is is this is a uh, report on bills that we really didn't cover in our you know we did it in an end of session report which really covered the uh, the major pieces of legislation that moved through the process including the budget um, and as well as bills that board members had uh, individually raised with us that they wanted to be kept apprised of um, and then since then we have added a, a series of bills which are included in this deck um, that we wanted to verbally go through um, today and, and they will obviously overlap with both the FADS and the FSBA documents, um, but we actually work uh, with FADS on the development of their, their document, and that's really the document that the district administration needs in order to go through the implementation of kind of the granular level of some of these bills where we will need a board policy or, or various updates, and we will be assisting the uh, the district um, as needed if questions come up about things that that may not you know make perfect sense with how Sarasota does things, or if we need some more intent, or exactly what we need to accomplish. You know, we are available to uh, to track those down by both speaking with legislative staff, um, the Department of Education, and even the sponsors in in some in some instances. Um, but Megan has put up the uh, the document that we have today, and the good news is we will not need the. 60 minutes um, as this is kind of a supplemental update from our last report so I should give you guys uh, some time to, uh, to to get a to get a longer lunch but certainly you know after we run through these bills um, if there are any additional questions about these or, or other items that have come up since our last report you know we can certainly take the opportunity to address those so yeah Megan if you want to go ahead and flip to the first bill okay well the uh, the first bill that I wanted to cover today is uh, is Senate Bill 1108 by Senator Diaz. Um, this bill has not yet been um, uh, approved by the governor. It has been presented to him, and he has until June 29th to sign it. Um, the bill covers a few somewhat unrelated topics, but of primary interest to districts is a provision that requires school districts to offer the SAT or ACT to all 11th grade um, students in the district. So that will be a new, uh, new opportunity or new offering um, beginning next year. The bill also includes a pilot program, um, which is 
essentially an, it's called an innovative blended learning model um, of in and out of classroom learning. It's somewhat of a uh, spillover from remote learning um, under the COVID environments. Uh, this is something that I believe a few high-performing charter schools wanted to pursue. So the legislature enacted it and allowed high-performing charter schools, as well as high-performing school districts, uh, to make an application to the department. And if they're approved, they could continue to offer this blended learning model. Um, it does have some pretty uh, stringent requirements to it. And essentially, I believe the biggest one is that a, a student station must be available to the student uh, that is uh, virtual or remote learning on any given day. So essentially the student decided he, be, he or she wanted to be in the classroom that day or wanted to do remote learning as well as uh, various other um, requirements in order to uh, uh, make application to get it approved. Um, Senate Bill 1108 also requires voting to be included in character development curriculum for grades 11 and 12, requires the uh, statewide ELA and math assessments to be paper-based for grades 3 through 6 only, and also allows some e English language learners, ELL, to demonstrate grade-level expectations on formative assessments instead of passing the 10th grade ELA um, assessments. Uh, the next bill I wanted to mention to you is a House Bill 157, which is first aid training in public schools. It has uh, not yet been presented to the governor. Um, very straightforward bill. Uh, today, essentially, school districts are encouraged to provide basic first aid training, which includes CPR, beginning in grade six and then every two years after. Uh, this bill will amend the law uh, to encourage districts to, to provide this training in grades six and eight, but then require the training in grades nine and 11. So it's uh, additional first aid training um, that's a, a mandate to be provided in public schools. Uh, the next bill is House Bill 7033. It also has not yet been presented to the governor, but it creates a task force um, and the, and the uh, appointed entities, the Senate president, the speaker, and the governor are currently looking for people to appoint to this task force. Um, it, that will be under the Department of Education to help find evidence-based strategies for closing the achievement gap um, between boys and girls. Uh, the next bill that I wanted to cover is House Bill 5, which is a civic education curriculum bill. It has been presented to the governor, um, but the governor has not yet acted on it. He has until June 26 to, uh, to approve the bill. But effectively, the bill revises the social study requirements for high school graduation by requiring that the half-credit U.S. government course include a comparative discussion of political ideologies, um, as you can see on the screen. Uh, what those political ideologies are. Um, the bill also includes the Patriots in Patriotism Act, um, all capitalized, uh, which will develop an oral history resources based on personal stories, um, including those who were victims of these other governing philosophies, and it will compare life under those philosophies to life in the U.S. Um, and importantly for, uh, for our district, as well as uh, other districts, is the Department of Education is, is, intends to develop um, or improve an integrated civics education curriculum uh, that will need to be incorporated in all grades K through 12. Uh, curriculum will um, supposed to help students understand their rights and responsibilities as a citizen, foster, foster sense of civic pride and create a sense of civic awareness in how government works. Um, importantly, school districts and charter schools are able to submit their own integrated civics education curriculum for DOE approval instead of using the Department of Education's curriculum if that's what the district wants. And this is um, only and for school students. It's not for the legislators to take, right? <laughs> they, they just write They just write what's important okay. and then everybody else has to learn it, as you recall. <laughs> um, and then, uh, then the next bill, before I turn it over to Megan for a bill or two um, that I wanted to mention, is House Bill 259. And this is, uh, it has not been sent to the governor yet um, for his approval, so it's still uh, waiting over in the legislature. But this is a, a law related to uh, concealed carry on public school property. And the law was, or on school, on school property, not just public school property, but this law was designed to fix what was called an oversight or loophole, where people with concealed weapons permits were unable to carry their concealed weapons at a church or other religious institution on the weekend because the institution, say, had a preschool on its grounds, um, and there's a prohibition on firearms on school property. So as a response to that, the legislature passed this bill in the final bill language 
basically says that it's up to the religious institution to decide whether its, uh, its, its members or, or attendees can carry firearms. And that's even if the institution is leasing somebody else's property. Um, and that would include under the bill uh, public school property. So what this means is that under the bill, a concealed carry is allowed on leased school property if the religious institution were to allow it. Um, now this has, you know, certainly there was some there was some angst about the bill as it's making its way through the process. It is clear that if the district uh, would like or any district would like to make clear that concealed carry is, is not allowed on school district property, even if that property is leased to a religious institution, then then that prohibition will need to be in the lease documents. Um, and, and many districts, I don't, I don't know exactly how Sarasota handles this, but I do know that many districts do have such a prohibition in all of their leases, um, whether it's to a religious institution or anywhere else, uh, that would prohibit the, uh, the lacey from allowing firearms to be carried on school property. So, so that's a bill, like I said, that, that we'll need to, uh, to look at um, depending on where we stand on our leases. Uh, Megan, you want to handle the next bill? Sure. Thanks, Ron. Um, House Bill 1159, um, titled very broadly Education, has not been sent to the governor um, for approval or veto yet. But um, this bill uh, creates um, two new pathways to meet teacher certification requirements. Um, it allows um, a master's degree or higher from an approved um, institution to substitute for the mastery of general knowledge requirement. And it also allows for um, professional education competency requirement. Uh, to be uh, met through completion of a DOE-approved educator preparation institute and receipt of a highly effective rating um, by the teacher. Um, it also requires the Department of Education to release BAM data to school districts by July 31st of each year. And it, um, it expands the uses of the William Cecil Golden Professional Development Program um, from just principals, which is what it currently is today, um, to teacher leaders, assistant principals, and district leaders. And it also, um, one other thing to note, it does require that teacher preparation programs um, have to require that students pass the general knowledge exam uh, by the time that they graduate from those programs. Ron? Okay, yeah, thanks, Megan. So the next bill is um, House Bill 337, which is a bill that was actually sponsored by Senator Gruters on the Senate side. Uh, it relates to uh, impact fees, and it was approved by the governor on June 4th. Uh, the proponents of this bill were um, certainly the developers and home builders who feel that uh, certain uh, counties are getting a little too um, a little too free and uh, and 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 increasing their impact fees a little too high um, than they believe is uh, reasonably related to the development. Uh, there are some allegations in uh, in both Hillsborough and Broward County where the local governments are collecting impact fees that aren't going back into actually addressing the impact from the developments that they're collecting them from. And so suffice it to say, this bill had a lot of um, support uh, in the legislature and made it through the legislature pretty quick. Basically, the bill had several restrictions to local governments and their use of impact fees, uh, particularly with respect on the ability to raise the amount of the fees um, going forward. On the positive side, we did work to make sure that the bill defined infrastructure to include school buses and equipment necessary to uh, to equip them for official use, uh, because as we believe that uh, that that with more um, with more students comes more of a need for for school buses and transportation. So that was something that we felt may have been left out in the way they defined um, the. Uh, the definition, but they did. Uh, the proponents did um, go ahead and include that. But the bill does restrict the ability of local governments to increase impact fees um, using various kind of step-up thresholds about how much a fee could be increased at any given one year, and if it's a certain percentage increase, has to be broken out over. Uh, I believe it's four years in the bill. Um, but there is an exemption to these new thresholds, but it would require that the county do an updated uh, rational nexus test, which is the uh, kind of legal test that says that the, um, the fees being collected are directly 
uh, connected to the impact of the development. Um, there would need to be a recent study of the impact fee, which shows what the calculation would would be or the available calculation of what the uh, the impact of the development, how much it would cost. There would need to be two public meetings and then a two thirds vote of the governing body that assesses or uh, institutes the impact fee. Um, also, to make sure that no local governments tried to in increase their impact fees to effectively beat the bill before it was signed on June 4th, um, this bill does include a retroactive application back to January 1st. So even if uh, a local government increased their impact fees in February or March before this bill was law, uh, the bill purports to regulate and undo that. I will say there are strong feelings that this retroactive portion going back to um, January is likely unconstitutional uh, because it does actually change a, a vested right to assess an impact fee. So if there is a challenge to that, that, that uh, retroactive piece may ultimately end up taking down the entire piece of legislation. But there were a number of um, counties and, and districts that increased their impact fee because this bill was being considered by the legislature. I can think off the top of my head, five or six counties that went ahead and increased their impact fee from, I guess they were assessing 60 or 70% of the available impact fee up to 100% while this bill was being considered. So the, uh, the retroactive piece may in fact end up in litigation. And so that's yet to be determined. All right. Next up, we have another bill on civics education, which is a, a very hot topic um, this legislative session. The governor does have this bill, and he has until June 29th to act on it. But um, it is essentially directs the DOE to develop um, additional civics um, education curriculum that will be incorporated into the United States government class. Um, so this is just for high school which is different from the bill that Ron covered a few minutes ago, which was K through 12. Um, but that begins in the 22-23 school year. Um, the bill also allows public schools that are offering high quality civics education as determined by the Department of Education to be designated as a freedom school. And it also allows students who are participating in the USF uh, Youth and Government Program to earn college credit for that participation. Um, the next bill, House Bill 149 students with disabilities in public schools um, has not yet been sent to the governor for review. Um, this bill is a, bar a bipartisan bill um, that is an effort to address um, the use of seclusion and restraint in public schools. Um, the bill creates several new definitions in statute, but um, mainly it, it prohibits seclusion and it um, establishes limits on the use of restraints in classrooms. It also establishes a new pilot program in Broward County where a parent can request a camera to be installed in a self-contained classroom. Next slide. And the final three bills that, that I'm going to cover all relate to uh, to workforce. Um, there was uh, there was some significant activity with uh, with some uh, redesigning of the way that we handle industry certifications and various workforce issues. Um, none of these bills have yet been sent to the governor, um, but they do have provisions in it that that are important for school districts to understand. Um, first, Senate Bill 366, um, educational opportunities re leading to employment. Um, there's really two provisions that are important to school districts. First, um, the bill provides that unpaid students interning or getting workplace experience as a part of an educational pro program will be considered employees of the school district for workers' comp purposes. Um, and certainly, as you can recognize, this has risk management implications. This is a uh, proposal that the Department of Education has been supporting for a number of years, and it ultimately was enacted in Senate Bill 366 this year. Um, the legislature did appropriate $2 million to help reimburse employers or school districts um, to once you show an added cost to your insurance premium for adding these students to your workers' comp policy. So that's something that risk management will want to pay attention to. Um, second, the bill does slightly modify the eligibility requirements for dual enrollment um, in college credit courses. Instead of the current 3.0 um, plus an appropriate score on a placement test, the requirement is now a 3.0 um, with a demonstrated level of achievement of college level communication and computation skills um, on an assessment that the Department of Education will be developing and working through. The next bill is Senate Bill 52, post-secondary education by Senator Rodriguez. Um, and the bill it basically establishes the responsibilities of state colleges and school districts with respect to creating an early college program. This was previously the College Gate High School program. 
which is an acceleration program for high school students to take post-secondary courses uh, towards their um, associate's degree with an emphasis on uh, core general education courses. The bill does authorize charter schools to enter in an agreement with a state, local college, or other authorized institution directly rather than uh, working through the school district. Um, and finally, the bill also creates a dual enrollment scholarship program, which will allow private and homeschool students to participate in, in a dual enrollment without cost, including materials. And it will also reimburse uh, colleges and universities for public school students taking dual enrollment during the summer, um, which is a positive. And then uh, finally, the last bill is House Bill 1507. This is probably um, the, uh, the, the, the most impactful bill, I will say, out of the workforce bills. Um, you can tell by just what they've named it. Um, it's called the Reimagining Education and Career Help um, Act, other, otherwise known as the REACH, um, which is an attempt to really redo workforce education um, in the state of Florida. Creates a REACH office uh, within the governor's office to help students gain access to educational program. The mantra of this bill is high needs, high wage jobs. Uh, they're going to do this through greater accountability and analysis of the job market to make sure that the industry programs being offered are the best for meeting the workforce needs of the state. Um, there's a new credentials review committee, which will examine all approved credentials and degree programs and look to prioritize them on state needs and also develop a return value formula. Um, and the REACH office will also create an online portal for everybody to go to and help basically people who are trying to figure out what skills they would like or what training they would like of which training and skills would help them most uh, find a job. Um, for school districts, there are a couple of specific provisions that, that we need to pay attention to. The first is an open door workforce grant program program, which could cover up to two-thirds of the cost for short-term high-demand uh, programs, and uh, both school districts and state colleges will be eligible um, through this grant program uh, once it gets up and running. The next is a, a new concept um, that, that, was that was mostly talked about in, in the uh, higher ed space, but certainly also has some impact to, uh, to school districts, which is called the Money Back Guarantee Program. It won't begin until 22-23. Um, but uh, school districts will need to designate at least three programs that are eligible for the money back guarantee. And basically, if a student creates the program, cannot find employment within six months of, creating, of completing the program, they would receive their tuition money back. Um, and then finally, uh, bill changes uh, industry certification performance funding from its current $1,000 per certificate for successful completion to a payment where one third of the payment is based on students finding employment and the remaining two thirds based on the students' earnings in that employment. Um, but both the money back guarantee, um, you know, and the, uh, and the performance funding, you know, do not apply to the regular district career um, and technology, te techno technological, uh, um, technical, sorry, I'm having a hard time getting through this last one, education students, because, you know, certainly they don't pay tuition, um, and the, uh, and the, and the um, performance funding would only apply to industry cert um, certificates at our technical centers and not through most of our, uh, you know, middle school and high school industry um, certificates. So with that, um, unless, Megan, you've got anything else to add, that's kind of our supplemental update report. Uh, like I said, these are all bills that, that we um, followed and, uh, and, and participated in discussions on, but they weren't ones that were really at the forefront of our original, um, of our original uh, presentation and, up and report to the board. So we wanted to take this opportunity and in this workshop to kind of give you the full picture of, of other bills um, that were out there. Now, certainly, this is still not an exhaustive list, as you can see from the uh, from the reports in your packet. There are still, you know, a number of other bills that do have impact onto uh, onto school districts. Um, but you know, the impact begins to get more tenuous um, as we get off of the list of what we've um, presented to you all. Any questions? You know, I I. I've have a, a concern that was, you know, brought up a group of teachers talking, um, and they're they're getting confused. On the one hand, they're being told how they must teach civics and how they have to talk about the differences of political parties and, um, you know, the how our country was founded and all these things. 
Um, and then on the other hand, there's a parent's bill of rights that allows parents to object to anything that's being taught. And, um, you know, we've got teachers on both sides of these issues and parents on both sides of these issues. And these issues are just so um, hot and heavy at this moment um, is the way I'd like to say. I mean, so when our community is divided um, um, and, you know, the teachers on both sides of the aisle are concerned, you know, about if they're talking, you know, or they say something incorrectly or, you know, there was, we made them take down a lot of posters that had anything to do with, you know, Black Lives Matter, re, uh, you know, uh, talks or, you know, and now they're like, well, now we got to start talking about political parties and, and governments in different countries, comparing them to the U.S. and how if we say the wrong thing, you know, what kind of... Uh, what kind of protections do teachers have? I mean, can they lose their jobs over these things, or can they be fined, or in that Parents' Bill of Rights? Are you frozen with that smile? <laughs> I think they were all frozen. <laughs> no, 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 I was listening. I, it, yeah. <laughs> No, no. Bad connection. Bad connection. No, um, no. I, I heard. I heard ninety nine percent of what you said. Um, first, you know, there there are a couple of uh, of issues certainly that are uh, that that kind of need to be covered, and 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 I think the question that you asked me. But the first one that's relatively easy is is the parental bill of rights. Um, I will say that that I would stay tuned on that bill. Um, there, I don't know what ultimately is going to happen to that bill, whether it's going to be approved or not. The Florida Medical Association is is calling for a veto of that bill because of its impact on how they feel they're uh, required to treat um, uh, uh, children and some of the rights that are uh, listed in the bill. So I'm not quite sure what's going to ultimately happen there. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, the intent of the bill as it relates to education was not necessarily to create new rights that parents didn't have. It was to put all of the rights in a single place and provide more notice to parents of rights that they currently, um, that, that parents currently have related to the education and welfare of their children in public school districts. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, there has, and everybody, you know, we all recognize it, um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, outside forces um, that are getting more and more involved in public education, both at the school board level and as well as uh, parental involvement with what teachers are teaching their students and what's going on in individual schools. Um, it, where I always go back to on all of those items is teacher training. We do a lot of teacher training and teachers have a lot of questions. There's a lot of changes happening. The state board is changing um, you know, required instruction criteria, uh, which is not yet completed. They actually did an amendment to that rule following the state board meeting that was released yesterday. So the language is still in flux and hasn't been adopted. We have a number of bills out there that make changes to your to your point to civics education. We're gonna have new curriculum um, either developed by the state State board or developed by the district that's going to be incorporated. And once all of this stuff starts to get a little bit more settled as to, you know, what we're actually looking at for, you know, the fall year, it's going to be incumbent on the district to help teachers work through that and understand through teacher training um, what, you know, what, what they need to be instructing on in, in areas that either, you know, politically or because of, you know, state board rule or because of legislative fiat have either been encouraged or uh, placed off limits. Um, so sorry for the long answer to it, but but I do think that 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 it's incumbent on everybody to, I mean, I know that we focus on teacher training as one of the top things, you know, that we certainly do to support our teachers in the district, but it's gonna be even more important, um, you know, as we make our way through these, uh, these next uh, coming months before the fall. So these civic li literacy programs that they're gonna be coming up with, Will those be for the next school year already? I mean, do they ha they have to have meetings and stuff when they create them, don't they? I mean, I don't know if it's for next year or the year after that they have to uh, start uh, doing this. Um, I can speak to the second bill that I think it was Senate Bill 146. Um, that, that bill is not effective until or the curriculum is not, not incorporated into the U.S. government high school class until t um, school year 22-23. So it would not be this upcoming school year. It would be the following school year. Oh. And Ron, is that the same with House Bill 5? 
I, I believe so. That's what I was just looking at. And that would also coincide with, I believe, when, when we'll have um, the, uh, the next social studies um, materials adoption coming down the pike as well. Um, the effective date is 2021 of the other civics bill, but I do believe some of the curriculum is delayed in order to make sure that it's developed or give school districts the ability to, to uh, submit their own curriculum for DOE approval. Well, I think you'll be working with our, our the learning communities, our teachers, you know, in these other areas to get them up to speed and let them know what's happening. Yeah, I'm getting a nod. Okay. Um, yes. Any other questions? There's a lot going on this session. No? And, and, yeah, they, they told us it was going to be a light education session, and they, they ended up passing more than 30 education bills. Uh, I, I know one that you sort of <clears throat> uh, didn't touch on was the expansion of the um, different scholarship programs. Um, and <laughs> now the civic literacy and all of these other things, they don't ha those things don't apply to the, um, the, the schools that are getting these scholarships. I mean, all of these laws only apply to the public schools, correct? That that's correct, and the, uh, the the student empowerment scholarship bill expansion, you know, was certainly one that we've that we've been updating the board on. We didn't. If if anybody needs some more information on it, we can certainly do that from our from our last report. But but you're absolutely correct. Um, uh, other than I believe the educator conduct bill, um, which requires, which is some a bill we've talked about in the past, which requires all schools to, you know, check um, a, basically a state blacklist on educators who have been accused of sexual misconduct or, or selling um, narcotics. Uh, other than that, all of these bills really only apply to public schools. Um, the educator conduct bill does require, to, it does apply to, you know, um, non-public schools as well, everybody who is a, uh, who is a school will need to check that blacklist. But, but for the most part, every other bill that we've talked about is for public schools, both charters and uh, traditional. Well, and then the expansion of the uh, dual enrollment for college, that, that is affecting the private schools, too, in a positive way. Right. Um, with uh, no other questions or comments, I guess we will say thank you uh, for a um, odd year, a, a busy year, uh, and I would think a rather difficult year uh, to get to uh, our legislators and uh, things were happening so fast and changing some sometime rather drastically from one day to the next. And uh, we appreciate you being on top of that and letting us know as things were happening. I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> Ron and Megan, well, thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank you, Ron. Thank, Thank you, you, Megan. Really appreciate it. I, uh, you know, if, if we have other questions or we have some needs as we write curriculum and place things in our uh, pupil progression plan and policies and so forth, we'll give you a call and be able to hopefully work through that with you. So thank you very much. I know that um, Tom and Jane and I were at FSBAS. So you were at the FADS, the joint meeting, mm -hmm. and, and we got a lot of information. I haven't been able to read through it all yet. Um, but uh, I know I know that we'll be talking about this for some time to come, and I understand we we've, we've got a lot of policy changes that we'll have to do. But we've got a company that works with mm -hmm. the state and gets all of those to us. <clears throat> so we'll be hearing more about these things as we progress. Just the report; it isn't over yet. <laughs> now we have no. to start implementing these things. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks. Uh, item three. Yes, our next item is our uh, equity report. Um, and uh, Dr. Moore is going to present that to us. But uh, this report is one that I've talked about before. Once a year, uh, we submit this report uh, to the DOE and they provide feedback for us as we go. It's kind of an ongoing thing. And uh, but every year around this time is due to uh, to the DOE. And so Dr. Moore is going to um, present the different items that are in the equity report. And I know it's a, a lengthy report uh, that we sent to you and, and it's one that the board approves every year. Uh, and then we send it to the DOE. So 
she is going to uh, highlight the uh, the changes and some of the things that we had from last year that we worked on for this year and then what we're working on for next year. Um, and then we can uh, have some questions at the end. Thank you. Dr. Moore. Thank you, Dr. Aspen. Good morning, Madam Chair and esteemed board members. Um, so we're all going through this together. Um, this is a new assignment for me. And what I'd like to do is um, just kind of walk you through a few things. I know I sent you a lot of information, and hopefully you had an opportunity to sift through some of it. But I, as Dr. Aspen said, I really want to hit the high point. So I kind of have a summary of, of the highlighted items that I wanted to address that we had to look at from last year's report and then any items we had to look um, at for this year's report. So the items that I'm going to kind of focus on is the summary, then the um, what they call the MWP, which is the monitoring work plan. It looks like this, this document here. And then, um, and then I also gave you kind of um, the equity shell, which I actually embedded the information in this year and anything that we had to attach, you saw in those, I broke it out by each part, so it would be easier for you to see it. And then the cover letter that will go with the document once it is electronically sent to the state, as well as a copy that will go via U.S. Post Office. Um, so in compliance with Florida, Department of Education, the Florida Edu Education Equity Act, each school district is required to submit an annual update respective of the FDLOE's mission and goals of equity, access and closing the achievement gaps among minority and non-minority groups in accordance with federal and state statutes and regulations. The responsibilities of the Office of Equal Opportunity include compliance oversight of the Florida Educational Equity Act. Um, section 1000.05, Florida statutes, and other federal and state legislation relating to equity in education. I, I'm mostly going over this for the people who are not here with us, who didn't get all that you have. So I want people to understand what this report is about, because it's not privy to everyone. The Florida Education Equity Act and other federal and state legislation, such as Title IX, Title VI, Title II, and Section 504 prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, disability, age, or marital status against students and employees. The FEEA and the State Board of Education Rule 6A 19.0019 comma 010 require OEEO to monitor public school districts compliance with the statute. The annual education equity update is a reporting tool that enables the OEEO, OEEO office to monitor and ensure adherence to provisions of the laws and that educational resources are equitably distributed. So I just wanted that, that's mostly for other people, not for you all, because I know you read all this wonderful information. So the report itself is broken up into seven sections. And the state sends a tool along with the monitoring work plan, which provides us with information regarding actions that we might need to focus on as a district. That um, monitoring work um, document provides information regarding any actions that are required. So the first part is the pr are the procedural requirements. Um, part two are, are any incomplete items or pending actions. And that's usually where if there are any changes in policy, those things fall in that section. Part three is student participation, and that deals with where we're placing students in all of our level three IB, ACE courses, dual enrollment, and really looks at the percentages and numbers of students that are enrolled in those, particularly our targeted students, which are our ELLs, our African American, Hispanics, students with disabilities, and so on. Part four is the gender and equity and athletics. Part five, employment equity. Part six, single sex schools and classes, of which, to my knowledge, we have none. Um, and part seven, pregnant and parenting students. So um, I will go on and talk a little bit about um, what went for what went before you last year. I believe uh, Mr. Hereda sat before you from HR in December with these items for the 1920 MWP, um, and we had two areas in there. One was, um, excuse me, three. One was the procedural requirements, and this was to make sure that in all of our documentation and in all of our um, um, information for our voc vocational schools that we made sure that we had statements uh, that uh, dealt with uh, prohibiting discrimination and notification of identity of, contact information of the, whoever they needed to contact if they had any discriminatory issues and so on. 
So there was some information that wasn't on um, our vocational website, um, and um, and so we wanted to make sure that we got that information in. So that was corrected last year, and I have also added it in this year's packet, which you will see um, in your attachments. Um, and that comes under uh, part one of the procedural requirements, and then part two, um, incomplete um, items or pending actions. Part one is the annual notification, again, of non-discrimination for vocational education programs. I offer those in two ways, both as links that um, can be uh, accessed from the electronic uh, cover letter that I sent, as well as the attachments. So all of the information in which those are noted in our vocational information are included in the documents that will be sent to the state. Part three um, is student participation, and that is uh, grades 9 through 12, all level three courses, including AP, IB, ACE, DE, and honors. And just making sure that um, we were showing information for all of our students. And in the previous um, document, the ELL students were not represented, and that has been corrected, and they are in the current um, information that um, you have been um, sent. Part four um, is the gender equity in athletics. Um, and again, it says that we should continue to monitor the participation in athletics. And, um, and also we must send compliance verification documents and make sure that they are reviewed and signed by the superintendent. And we have included those this year. There are a couple of schools that, um, that uh, submitted and I believe if you have a chance to had a chance to look at those because it's so much but we had usually it's the high schools if there are any actions that are noted and we had uh, four high schools um, that were noted in that and um, and all of them have submitted any information if they were not in compliance in the last report they have corrected that and that is stated in the documents that you have received in addition um, any of the 21 22 uh, actions have been addressed. So that will be Booker High School. They submitted a 21-22 plan in their documents. Northport High School is in compliance from some actions that they needed to address um, last time. Riverview High School did submit a 21-22 plan, action plan, and that's to increase volleyball so that they can get more gender equity in the girls' participation. The Booker um, um, plan is a plan that is, was be, began in like 2011 and has gone on and they continue to work on ensuring that they have equity in their, um, uh, gender equity in their activities. Um, Sarasota High School um, did submit from their previous year, um, 2021, so they're in compliance and Venice High School um, submitted a 21-22 um, plan of action. And um, later, if you wanted to go through those in more detail, we can look at those documents because I have them right here. Typically, they're just making sure that they're connecting with other agencies and groups and making sure that they have the right numbers of students involved and that all students have an equal opportunity to participate in those sports. But they're different for each school. The employment equity um, um, portion is uh, one in which I know that we are working on um, that is now that we have to look at. These are all under the current um, 2021 actions and one of the actions that's required under employment ac uh, equity is that the district should develop strategies to address underrepresentation of minority and male employees in administrative and faculty positions um, strategies should be submitted and we have submitted those strategies and they are embedded in what you have received I did kind of break it out so that you can see you know clearly where we are with this it is something that we um, are working together with HR both of course the HR di executive director is new and so am I so we're kind of talking as she's wrapping her arms around her part and me around mine um, having these conversations so that we can begin to work with her team to um, definitely ensure that the strategies that that it, we have set up and the goals that they have set up um, that we'll be able to accomplish those and achieve those so when we look at our district level administrators um, we did see the total number and I went by total number rather than percentages because in some instances if there were some increases because they were so small the percentage stayed the same but I did want to note that there were changes either up or down specifically by number so the total number of blacks increased by two in our district level administration from 10 to 12 and males from set by seven from 56 to 63 and males were an area that we were um, required to um, have some some sort of show some sort of growth with um, within our district 
Um, in terms of the total number of Hispanics, that remained the same at two. Principals, um, our total number from uh, 1920 to 21 increased from 39 to 48. The total number of blacks decreased um, by one from five to four, and that was due to promotions. Anytime you start seeing movement, you see changes in those numbers. Total number of males increased by three from 17 to 20, and the total number of Hispanics remained the same at zero. Assistant principals, um, the total number from 1920 to 2021 increased from 72 to 73. The number of blacks decreased by one from five to four, again, due to promotions. The total number of males increased by two um, from 21 to 23, and the total number of Hispanics remained the same at two. Teachers um, totaled increased from 2,752 to 2,833. The total number of blacks increased by three from 80 to 83. The total number of males increased by 31 from 535 to 566. And the total number of Hispanics de decreased by three from 107 to 104. In terms of our guidance counselors, the total number from 1920 to 21, 2021 increased from 86 to 88. The total number of blacks decreased by one from 10 to nine. The total number of males decreased by one from 10 to nine. And the total number of Hispanics remained the same at two. Um, I did, as I mentioned earlier, I did include the documentation for the goals to address the disparity in staff demogra demographics, and we are certainly uh, going to be working um, diligently to put some things in place so that we can reach out to some of our different um, HBCUs and other our Hispanic colleges, some of our natives. I was on a, um, a meeting on Friday with USF, talking with them about um, looking at teachers and administrators and looking at different places that we can um, go into pools, both locally and out of state, so that we can start to attract some high quality teachers, not just you know one or the other, but really high quality, diverse teachers that represent the demographics of our community, which has changed tremendously over the past few years. Um, part seven, um, pregnant and parenting students. Um, we are required to make sure that we're providing equal access and equitable access for our teen parents in all aspects of their schooling so that um, while we are taking care of the little ones um, and helping them get through that pregnancy that they also have opportunities for you know accelerated courses or to participate in sports and other activities and clubs and organizations on the campus um, there is a very extensive set of goals that have been put in place for those young ladies and gentlemen um, because the dads also get to participate um, and so that is included in this report. So um, that those are the areas um, for this particular report that we needed to focus on and make sure that we showed actions for, even though we did it for every aspect and every um, part of the seven parts of this document. Those are the areas that we needed to focus on and have addressed for this year and are included. So um, with that, um, the last thing that I will say before I open it up for any questions from you is, the last doc, the last page that you have, or three pages, are the is the uh, cover letter that looks like this, and you see it has lots of colors because there are live links in there. But the last page is something that's new um, that I think is very important for us to, as a district, and um, and I think I gave you a new one because I added um, reviewed and approved by above the signature for uh, Dr. Asplin and for the board chair. I think that um, I have not, I did not see that. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, if you saw it, how you saw it and how it was approved. So I think it's important that we document this, um, that everyone has seen it, and read it, uh, looked at it, discussed it, and that we have, a, we have um, proof that we have approved it and that it moves forward. So with that, I will see if you have any questions for me. Thank you. I have a question, maybe Dr. Aspen, and I don't know if you even can answer it. How long have we been required to uh, provide this report? Um, <clears throat> I became executive director of Human Resources in 2011, and I had to do it then. So I know it's been at least since then. I, 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 I just with all of this information and somebody we are required to be focusing on this um i know you set up this office of equity uh, i thought it was more about you know those other issues that we were hearing about but my goodness um you know she's got her hands full with you know some of these other things and i i just 
surprised we didn't have somebody doing this before. And uh, I, I, I... Well, I know Al Hereda has been, correct, Jody? Yes. Yeah, Al Hereda yes. has been doing this Oh, he hasn't past. had anything to do yeah. else to do, I'm sure, in the yeah. last few years. <laughs> um, I'm sure he's glad you've taken this Oh, over. I'm sure he is, too. <laughs> I told him that, too. I said, you know, uh, yeah, mm -hmm, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad we have somebody that, that truly is um, focusing on this uh, as their, you know, their main priority. What we have to do is, you know, when the state is looking at us and requiring us to do this, I, I'm, and I just don't think it should have been somebody to doing this in their spare time. Yeah. Um, well, this aligns with a lot of what Dr. Moore is, is doing, and I know she's very detail-oriented, plus big picture-oriented, so I know she'll do a fantastic job with this. So. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, and, and I do. I, I appreciate all the work that you've put into it, and, and, and nothing against Al, but I'm sure there was a lot more thought, preparation, and looking into it this year than we've ever had before and looking forward because I just don't see how anybody could have done this in addition to, I mean, and I know that Al has had his hands full the last couple of years with yeah. other issues going on. So um, you're on the job none too early. <laughs> well, to um, Mr. Hereda's credit, um, to having gone through this, um, probably with a lot, because I had a different lens to work and time to work on it um he uh, you know for so many so long they were it was just he and danielle and a you know microcosm of folks over there so to be able to get um the folks in the district to you know get in the information and compile it and put it together doesn't leave a lot of time to really study it so um i my hat's off to him for being able to even get it compiled um, over these past few years and to uh, all of the departments that were able to supply me with this information because I asked for it much earlier from them. And so they were like lickety split getting it. And you know what all we've all been dealing with in education this year, been our classrooms and our specialists and our um, directors. So for everybody to really, um, you know, come together and uh, put these items together and then answer my questions because I you know, really went into it. And um, and so we all had some aha moments. And I think it's going to provide us great opportunity moving forward to really, really look at all of our goals um, and all of the measures that we're putting in place to address some of the equity issues in our district. And I think it'll make us much better for it. I certainly have learned a lot in uh, being able to comb through this and dig into it. Thank you. Um, uh, Tom? So I re recall the uh, last conversation in December, which um, really did come across, at least to me, just as a, a report of statistics. And to your point, um, uh, I could appreciate that there wasn't really any uh, available time and resource to, to study uh, the, the data. So um, I, and I hear, <laughs> I appreciate, uh, our new HR head and, and you both stepping into the jobs. But I just wondered if I could quickly ask, if possible, if there has been just in your first glances at the data and uh, if you have, have a priority of strategies and, and connection of goals, has that at all been established? For, for HR? For, 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 for all the whole it? equity process. As well, you've looked at this big picture mm -hmm. of data that came to you, which I, th I think was, as, as I'm hearing, somewhat of a, a surprise as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned aha moments. Mm -hmm. Are there? Can you share some of those with us? Well, I think, um, and, and really, uh, you know, because before I even really came into the position, I started looking at some data. Um, I started looking at our demographics um, of our district and the changes in our dis demographics of our students. I started looking at the demographics of our staff. Um, I started looking at the demographics of our school board. I, I, look, I took a whole historical perspective and looking at a lot of the data. And, um, and just realizing that, wow, um, we really have quite a ways to go just in terms of that, that part, you know, just in terms of representation of the people in our community. And, um, and so I think that um, the first major um, uh, move for us is dealing with our strategic plan. And I think um, Dr. Osmond has hit that right on because that's going to guide us in terms of what's most important and what's going to be most impactful in our district. I think that um, 
every goal that we set up has to be one that's reasonable and attainable. We can't do all of this in a day. I tell people every day, yes, I'm so glad to be in this position. I'm glad to be able to work with everybody. Um, my hands are in everybody's business, um, whether I like it or not, or they like it or not. Um, but in a gentle and loving way, because I really want to work with everyone. Um, I tell them I am not the black Messiah. I didn't make this and I can't fix it overnight, but together, um, working together as one for the success of all, I believe that we can all see some great improvements and changes in our district. So to answer your question, is there any one goal that's more important than the other? I think not. I think that we um, the, um, slow and steady wins the race, and I think we take each component as we can as a district and as a group of folks. Um, some of the things that I want to do is put together um, some working groups that can help specifically look at different areas um, to guide us through this work. But that um, our strategic plan, our equity um, plans and policies, our equity committee, all of those components, all of you, our, um, our, our, our staff, and our community members are going to be really, really impactful in doing this. We met yesterday with the, the Black Arts um, Initiative um, to just talk about how we integrate arts into our education. I um, participated at the Van Wezel this Saturday on an amazing um, hip hop concert, but what I didn't know was how much mathematics and ELA was tied into actually building those rhymes and those beats and all of that stuff. I was like, you know, amazed because I was on the webinar before that, but just there are so many components that we have richly at our fingertips in our district that I think is going to be um, really helpful in us moving forward, but we can only do what we can do at one time. That's why if you did have a chance to look at the data for the students um, in terms of um, IB and ELA and DE and level three courses, you see that it's a very small percentage change. That's because we need to have it reasonable and attainable because now we have people that are uh, in accountable places that we can really look at that data and work with our curriculum directors and work with our principals um, so that we can identify where those students are and if there are students that we're missing that need to be placed in some of these advanced classes. So it's slow and steady, but I can tell you that all the wheels are turning um, in the district so that we can do this in a manageable and reasonable way to achieve the goals that we want to in our district. Just as a, a follow-up, I appreciate everything that you've said. And as a new school board member, I uh, did a lot of the quick glances of demographics that you did across mm -hmm. the, the big spectrum of employees, school board members, all of the, 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 the students, all of that information. So I appreciate that the, the task that you've been handed is, is somewhat daunting. So I, I, I absolutely appreciate that. But I, I think what's important, at least for me, and, and as Ms. Rose uh, pointed out, I'm but one school board member, but getting some benchmark to start with so that we can begin to measure, so that we can begin to see our successes. I know that as a district that being A-rated, for example, is mm -hmm. important to us. So being the best at, uh, at what we do in every way, shape, or form is, is important. So I, I'm looking at, uh, at, at within reason, mm -hmm. having some ability to benchmark where we're at, mm -hmm. where we're at where we would like to be, all of which should be reasonable, obtainable goals. Mm -hmm. Completely agree with you, mm -hmm. just so that we can begin to get on that process. Absolutely. Um, the big piece of the, that bill that I, I highlighted here, that all educational resources are equitably, equ equitably distributed, mm -hmm. that is going to be a tough job. Mm -hmm. So I hear you, and thank you. You're welcome. Bridget? Thank you. It's funny. Um, as I was researching and reading through this, so thank you for providing this to us over the last week. One of my takeaways was I wonder if we or if the team ta has any takeaways, because what I do find and this is and I'm so glad that you said what you said. So because it was one of my questions. <laughs> but, you know, I know that DOE, you know, there's well intended, you know, in, in, there, there's good intentions a lot of times with the bills that we see go and then go to DOE rule. But then there's a lot of administration that comes down to us. And that's mm -hmm. not just true for this. It's true for a number of other things that I've certainly talked to you about. But but and then it's you know, you look at it and you think, OK, 
it, are there any kind of takeaways from this? So it's worth the time because that's the last thing we want to do is busy work. And and so you answered all of those questions that I had, because as a board member, you know, and Mr. and, and Dr. Aspen and I have talked about this, and I think um, Mrs. Brown maybe inferred it, but this was not something that was brought to the board, despite the fact that I mean, for for years, despite the fact that it was required to, and it was not our, we were not aware of that. And so I'm very glad it kind of it's coming to the forefront now that we're in compliance with doing what we're supposed to do, but also it aligns with your new position and the, you know, the, the, the striving goals that we have to really address. And I like that how we're aligning it up with the, the strategic plan, because there are a lot of elements that I had takeaways, but what made me most proud and you addressed it was that, you know, as you go through it, you do have some takeaways. It's not just quickly trying to be in compliance. I mean, that's kind of, that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, if we don't learn anything, or if we don't find any you know, opportunities to, to grow as an organization, then I don't like busy work just for the sake of busy work. And I'm sure no one in this room likes that either. So I appreciate it and I look forward to the, the future discussions. Thank you, Ms. Ziegler. Dr. Asplin. Yes, um, when I when I uh, when you say uh, you know what are the goals or what are the takeaways and and I know two that jump off the off the table at me on this uh, as Dr. Moore said was number one the diversity of our workforce, mm -hmm. um, you know and and just when I saw um, when I saw our Hispanic number at 0.1 percent in our district I about fell out of my chair because that that is such a huge goal that we need to figure out what we're going to do uh, and figure out the strategies that that we need. Um, I know you mentioned a few of the strategies. There's quite a few that that we can put in place and we're going to be working on that. But uh, but that is huge. And I know we're going to be working quite a bit on that. The other is the students in the higher level classes. Mm -hmm. We definitely need to have a strategy for that. Um, we can improve there tremendously. And I think especially in our target groups or mm -hmm. subgroups, um, we very much need to make sure that those students who qualify to be in advanced level classes are being pushed into those. I think there's quite a few students who aren't pushed in and do not go into those advanced level classes just because they're comfortable with what they're doing. And uh, so, so we have some strategies like looking at the PSAT and talking to parents about what we think uh, their students should do and try to push them into some of those advanced classes. I think that's really, really going to help. But that's the other item to jump off the, the, the table. Mm -hmm. And then uh, athletics. You know, athletics is always, um, it's always in here as, as a need because when you're looking at males and females and trying to balance that out uh, under, under the FHSAA rules mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, uh, each high school tries to work on that every single year and due to their demographics they're always working on different strategies and so that'll probably one that'll probably show up all the time all the but time. know that the schools are always working on it but I say those are the those would be the three big ones mm -hmm. that I see that I know that we're uh, we're working on Karen uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Moore, for the work that you are doing and I want to uh, reinforce the um, pieces that you brought up of how directly this relates to our strategic plan that is in process and just add a few pieces as we look at the uh, diversity and the uh, needs that you've uh, shared with us uh, as well as that are in the data points that came forth from the uh, just today from the financial advisory uh, committee and I want to reinforce best practices as we go forward and not only um, in the points that we've talked about but how we're delivering resources uh, just not um, the importance of having uh, diversity in staff but how our resources are divided amongst our schools and also looking at our community uh, partnerships that we can go uh, further beyond our local foundations and our organizations. I know recently that um, that I've visited the SOAR Learning Academy, uh, something that you are involved with and Dr. Asplund has, but I, th I think that we can really think out of the box mm -hmm. and bring all of these pieces together mm -hmm. in our strategic plan. But again, uh, wanting to reinforce those uh, connections in uh, more opportunities that exist in our community. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Um, thank you. I too saw that, that I was surprised at the low number of Hispanics we have um, in our staff and, and our administration mm -hmm. uh, because it is key for our parents to be able to communicate with their students' teacher, 
or somebody at their school or somebody in administration. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get Hispanic people, at least get people who speak Spanish, um, because I think it's key to at least get somebody at each of our schools or at least an administration, somebody that they can talk to, because I think that's very important for them to be able to have somebody that will answer their questions and, um, and definitely get more people on staff across the board that can do that. Because um, I know we do have some non-Hispanic people that, uh, or maybe they don't list their Hispanic because they're only like 25%, but, um, but they do speak Spanish and that help some ways, but mm -hmm. there's, there's still a big gap there. Uh, but thank you for all you're doing, and, and I'm so glad you're there for Did you push your number again? I, or did, I, I did. I just <laughs> have to add something to what you're saying, if I could, please. Pardon me? I'd like to add something, if oh, I could, go please. Ahead. Um, yes, and when you bring up the data reflecting um, the Hispanic piece in the equity report, I just want to uh, reinforce that same mindset of how we look across all aspects of the uh, budget, the staffing, the best practices, um, and uh, beyond the data points that are coming forth to us mm -hmm. in different reports. And I look directly at the uh, recent charter school and all of of the best practices in dual language programs mm -hmm. and that as we tackle these issues we do it holistically uh, with the uh, what best practices show us in data and uh, the programs that are coming forth in our own community and and folks like mrs chaffee that have already done extensive uh, mm -hmm. research and worked with our local um, universities in uh, different school districts so uh, thank you just want to reinforce that holistic approach i think will go a lot further faster thank, thank you madam you, chair Rose. thank you thank I you i actually met that principal um that the principal that's going to be um running that school she is phenomenal um and um i think she will bring some great things to our district from that aspect um she is you know you know we missed her um, but she's she's really really strong and phenomenal and um, and my goal is to work with everyone I've met with the charter principals um, as well as all of our principals because you know we all own the graduate and all, all those children are our children and we have to make sure that everyone gets what they need to be successful in this district and to just follow up on something you said mr. Edwards there are like three charges that I have and they're big overall one of course is addressing the achievement gap and all these things that we were just talking about um, with the um, high level, higher level classes, some of the things with things like the, um, the uh, community organizations like Soar Learning Center, um, the pre-K move that, uh, and movement that uh, Dr. Asman is doing with our um, kindergarten and pre-K, that area, um, looking at, so we've got the achievement gap, we've got, we're looking at um, our hiring and our diversity, that's the second thing. And of course, the third one is equity within our schools, meaning that we're having the resources. So when you ask that, my mind was in all of this, but those three key areas with the um, information that comes underneath them and beneath them and the activities and the goals that we have to achieve, it's fast, but it's doable. And we have to, under each of those, take one piece at a time. That's what I probably should have said to you initially, but that was my intent. So I hope I responded to those. And there are ways to get metrics to be able to determine if we are, in fact, doing what we say we're doing. Go ahead, Tom. So I, I appreciate exactly what you said. And um, I, I get a lot of questions all the time, as I'm sure you do, about what is Dr. Moore doing? <laughs> and why, why is she here? <laughs> and so I asked the question specifically so, um, so we can share information, share your thought process, to share all of your process with our community. And I also appreciate um, Dr. Aspen giving us those buckets of things that we can expect to talk about on a regular basis. And that's really what I, uh, the goal here from mm -hmm. a communications point of view is that we have elevated this topic mm -hmm. and we, we want to kind of know where we're at so that each time we get together and have the conversations, including our community, that we're talking about the same things. Well, we always need resources. Um, you know, we have, we have what we have, you know more than I. Um, and there's always a need for more because the need is great. 
Um, so as you are talking to people who are asking those questions, um, you know, we always need support in being able to um, fund projects, fund people, human resources, materials, things like that. So, you know, there are lots of ways that people in the community can support us and help, and they have. They've done tremendous jobs in helping us in every aspect of what we're doing. Um, however, as we really peel back the layers of the onion and look at the needs that we have, um, we see just how much more um, we need to be able to address all of those needs because we cut back so many things. We don't have literacy coaches. We don't have, you know, um, those other entities that we had in the schools that helped us to help children. So there are many areas that, you know, quite honestly, we can't really probably afford to to be able to just go and do. So, you know, things like that are very helpful. And I know our, our um, community-based organizations and philanthropists have been helpful, but you know, if you really want me to tell you that, that's, that's, yeah, I can just net it. Just like, I'm sorry, Dr. Aspen, you know, I'm always, always asking for money because I think it's important because sometimes it comes down to the dollar. Um, and, um, and we just, in order to be able to service our children and our staff and our community, it really sometimes just comes down to, you know, dollars and cents um, to be able to do what we need to do. And the priority of those dollars. Yes, ma'am. Not necessarily are you Just asking for more dollars. But as specifically. I would hope that you would be making priorities in dollars to Absolutely. us from um, the collective uh, conversations that we've had here from each individual board member. Absolutely. Um, yes, well, I, I would like you to take your priorities you know, to the superintendent and, and whatnot. And then when we're... Oh. Yes, I would like you to take your priorities to the superintendent so we can share them with us. And also, uh, you know, so that perhaps, you know, we're, we were talking about this morning, how do we prioritize how we use those funds with the referendum? Mm -hmm. I mean, the referendum dollars increased this year. How are we going to use them? Mm -hmm. um, so have that all part of those discussions. And I, I think you're seeing some heads nodding here that perhaps we can look at that if not in that budget in, in the referendum dollars maybe we can find a way to reach out and fill in some of these needs that you're saying are out there and so at least we can have some of the competing needs mm -hmm. um, that are out there that are looking at our dollars um, next we have oh, Jane thank you uh, I you know one step at a time and I know this is a big, a big get, a big ask, a big lift. Uh, but I really think the work that you're doing is the most important work that we're doing at the national and the state and the local level. I think this work on equity is so very important. And I've given you a lot of, I'm always forwarding an <laughs> article to you or, or something that, um, that I think would be helpful. But uh, I really, I really believe that uh, the work that you're doing is so very important, and I think in years to come, because some of these things will take time. Yes. I mean, you know, we have X number of assistant principals. Well, we can't fix that tomorrow. We can't go out and say, let's flip a switch, and now we have, you know, more. So some of those things are going to be across time, but now we know where we are. We know where we need to go in mm -hmm. the future. and. So I really want to thank you for taking on this job, uh, Dr. Moore. I think it's right up your alley. <laughs> I think that you're well suited to this work, but I think it's such important work to our community and to our nation. Thank so you. So thank you. Thank you. And my priorities are his priorities. So, so, so I'm sure he'll get those to you. But thank you all so much. Wait, we're, we're oh. not done yet. Oh. It, 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 uh, some part of our discussion brought brought more buttons in. Okay, uh, Br Bridget. Yeah, I'll be brief. I know I I would agree. I think that what, something you said, and I think it's so important, is that you, you mentioned like as an example, literacy coaches. Like, and so when we think about our goal here, and I know we keep going back to the strategic plan, but it, em it emphasizes how important it is. Our job is how important that that is for us to do our job effectively is to align our goals with how we how we fund things. And so to Mrs. Rose's point, it's not so much about more money, it's redirecting capital to the best way so we can achieve our outcomes. And I think that is the best way any, you know, an efficient organization is going to work. So I'm very excited. And so I I know you won't hold back on that nope. at all. And I but I'm very excited about that because I think there's a lot of times we talk about this and everyone wants to see that gap close. Everyone wants to lift, you know, every student up, yep. but it's and it's hard and they are a long range and that's why if 
a strategic plan is oftentimes five to seven years, right? And so those are all things that get me very excited. And I think something that this community can be excited about, that they're really lasered in and focused. We have the right people in the right positions to really start to move that forward. So I'm excited. Thank you. Me too. Thank you so much. Um, I also, uh, uh, Karen brought up the, the uh, Dreamers Academy, the charter school. Um, now, I understand that they received a lot of applicants, Hispanic, and they more than they needed. Uh, perhaps we could reach out to them. And I, and I think they received them from all over the country, and I think it was because of what they were offering. But I think maybe some of it had to do with being Sarasota, Florida, too. So maybe we might look at them and find out uh, how they attracted these people or, or if any of them are still left. Um, and you talk about diversity. I would like to see some more diversity on our school board, too, um, not just in our schools. Uh, there are three elections coming up. Um, it's not a, it's a whole year from now, a year and a half from now. I think qualifying is a year from now. Um, and it would encourage someone to be looking at uh, adding diversity to our board. With that, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Moore. You're welcome. Uh, next, <clears throat> next we have the operating budget update. Uh, Mitzi will fill us in on that. Good afternoon again. Um, so I am, I'm going to kick us off and then Krista's going to get into the numbers. Um, but uh, first I wanted to introduce, um, in the back of the room, you'll see a lovely young lady. <laughs> Her name is Cindy Stiglitz and she is the new um, budget supervisor. She comes to us uh, from Hillsborough Area Regional Transit where she was the director of budget and actually served as an interim CFO for a bit of time. Um, she also has history in Sarasota County government uh, and worked in their budget department and also did work with SCAT and Transit. So um, she actually found out about the job because of the transportation director, Jason Harris, called her <laughs> to let her know about the job. So, so we're very fortunate to get her and we're real excited that she's here. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to share, which I don't think she, Chris is aware I'm going to do this, but you guys remember this book, right? From the budget book is very different from the other budget books we've had in the past, which were in a binder. So we submitted that budget to the Government Finance Officers Association for their Distinguished Budget Award, not thinking in the first year we would ever get it. We'd just get lots of comments on things we needed to do to improve you know, transparency and communicating with the public. So I received this on May 3rd, well, it was dated May 3rd, and dear Ms. Corcoran, we're pleased to inform you, based on the examination of your budget by a panel of independent reviewers, that your budget document has been awarded the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award from the Government Finance Officers Association for the current fiscal period. This Congratulations. Award, <laughs> this award is the highest form of recognition in government budgeting. Its attainment represents a significant achievement by your organization. So I just wanted to brag on my budget staff who worked countless hours in the midst of COVID to put this book together and, uh, and meet all of the best practices as determined by the, you know, the overall body, the Government Finance Officers Association. So congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> the team worked very hard. It was a complete team effort. So yeah, thank you, Mitzi. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, so I'm going to start with just kind of reviewing the, um, the FEFP, the funding formula, the revenue side of what gives us our money to operate with. So um, our district, the, um, so let me see how to explain this. The legislature allowed us the opportunity to maintain the rate on the millage and didn't what's called rolling it back so that you kind of generated the same revenue year over year. This year they allowed you to actually take advantage of the growth with your rate. Um, our rate though is still gonna go down because we, um, 
we don't have as many students as we have property values. So we are capped at 90% local funding for the annual funding of ours. So our, ours will actually reduce next year. So while they allowed you to take advantage of growth, our growth actually caused us because we're capped to reduce the rate, which is great for our taxpayers. Um, and the preliminary values used by the legislature or the values used by the legislature are actually lower, the property values, than what we received from the property appraiser in the preliminary um, valuation as of June 1st. So we'll get the final evaluation July 1st, and that's what's going to actually be used to calculate the required local effort. But um, so that was good news. So it should hopefully go down a little bit. The base student allocation, which is the money per student that funds you know, keeping the lights on, the teacher salaries and everything for the most part, um, did go up by $53.24, or $53.42, um, which did but, but how much did the FRS cost us per student? She has that. I'm sorry, I don't have per student, but it's uh, 2.3 for our staff that 2. we have. 2.3 million. It went from 10% to 10.82%. So it was, and it was 30 something to, or something. Yeah, we calculated it. Yeah, we, I think it was like 37 or something. I think we did calculate that because I know Krista had it at the last workshop. I think I'd asked for it before. So a lot of that new base student allocation went to pay the required increase in retirement. Correct. Um, so. Uh, in addition to that increase, we did receive a small increase in the teacher salary increase allocation. You know, the legislature allocated a half a billion dollars last year, this current year, for teacher salary increases um, to predominantly increase the base salary for teachers to 47.5, which we were able to obtain, obtain, and then we were able to provide our um, teachers with a, an additional 3% raise, pretty much, across the board. Um, so the amount of the increase in the funding, though, is less than three-tenths of 1%. So we'll have to negotiate that with the union, but it's a very small component um, for the total. The one thing that was great is we did receive an increase in the mental health allocation, and that pretty much equivalates to five high school mental health therapists, which I, if you remember when um, Deb Jacqueline was here speaking with you, she was requesting seven. So we're going to do five with this funding and two with the CARES money. So, um, so that should be good. That should help her. Um, and then you get down to this middle section down here, and it gets really funny. So the, for the first time ever, um, the state modified the way they calculated their share of the FEFP to reflect the excess funding for students that didn't arrive, the hold harmless component, I guess you could call it, which is um, on line 56, it says emergency order funding adjustment. And you'll see that $7.7 .7 million. So they separated that out from line 49, the state FEFP funds, because um, you'll see next year it goes back to 27 million. So there was like a, a reduction of $179 a student that's then made up for in the next school year in the state funds. So it's kind of a wash, but it was just to kind of show, because we were down 900 students from what we originally estimated. So that's basically the funding for those students who didn't come, even though we incurred additional expenses by having way more staff in the schools than we normally have. Um, increased costs for subs and ff and e and other things so um so then at the end of the day the majority of the funding for the increase in the mental health allocation the teacher salary increase and the base student allocation came from a reduction in the class size allocation so the class size allocation went down by 99 dollars 87 cents a student so that's what was used to kind of fund all of the other items um, I'm not sure that I think it was K through three they felt was being overfunded and they modified it to more of a school-wide average than a class size average across the state. Um, so then at the end of the day, we did receive an increase in the discretionary local effort because that's based upon your property values and as they go up, those dollars go up. 
Um, but when you compare what we are supposed to receive in total revenue based on what the legislature passed on April 27th and what we received on our last calculation of the FEFP, we're actually losing 8606 a student. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Um, and that is without the FRS increase. So I, I've, I've followed education funding for three decades and got the ins and outs and had Al Widener explain to me how Tallahassee tells me we're giving you more money and the district says, no, you're not. And I have trouble figuring this year out. I just truly do. And, and even for the last several years, how we're getting negative FEFP because of, you know, they add other dollars that they're giving us in the calculation. I, 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 I just shake my head and I, 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 I am not even going to try to figure this out on my own to how you got to these numbers. I'm taking your numbers. Yes. Well, they're just literally taking the, the I, Florida I Education know. Finance Program fund document and comparing the last last to this. So it's the uh, one in April to the one we got in actually in April. One is the current year and one is what the legislature passed. Side by side comparison. I know it's weird. They're just things have changed so dramatically. And now the one thing that's not incorporated in here is the uh, the consolidation of the scholarship programs. So the Gardner scholarship dollars, the family empowerment scholarships and stuff and the increases in those are not included in this amount. Um, there is a reserve that was put in the back of the bill of over 400 million to help accommodate for that or potential growth of students returning to the public school setting. So, so hopefully those dollars will be enough to cover the growth in student enrollment um, and the increase in the scholarships. Um, One hopes. Car carry on. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Krista and she's going to kind of discuss where we're at currently and um, next year. Hello. Uh, just to follow back up to your question, Ms. Brown, um, so it comes to the cost is $53.87 per FTE for the increased FRS cost. So to your point, BSA went up 53.42, but the cost for FRS is 53.87. So 45, yeah. Correct. Oh, or, yes, so um, we didn't actually get an increase. We actually, what, what, 45 cents? And, and it's not the first year that this has happened. Okay. So just going to go over the narrative uh, information that you all were sent, and then we'll look at the actual financials. Um, so the information that you got is the results of operation uh, uh, estimated through the end of the year. We have also included in that is the uh, fourth calculation of the FEFP, which we hadn't had prior. And in that, we received additional funds for our state uh, FEFP um, due to the proration. It wasn't as much as we thought it was going to be. However, the actual cost of all of the scholarships was more, but we still netted better there. The revenues for local are declining, um, mostly due, no, there's lots of reasons with childcare and things like that, but mostly due to the adult ed that's coming in lower, the course fees. Salaries and benefits continue to trend lower than budgeted, of course, because we had reduced positions and vacant positions. Um, and looking at uh, what we have for our projected actuals with vacant positions, which includes obviously those on leave, not just, you know, totally vacant. We had over 100 positions instructional that were vacant this year as far as not being filled and also uh, medical or uh, leave. Also included in the projected actuals is the encumbrances. As you know, um, we always budget worst case scenario as if all the encumbrances are going to happen this year. If not, they would roll forward, but that's also included. 
Um, one good thing that has also happened, um, uh, projected through the end of the year, is that last time we came to you, we were uh, concerned we were going to have to give uh, Food and Nutrition Services a transfer. Um, thankfully, they've done a really great job, and they've gotten uh, additional federal revenues to where that doesn't look like that needs to happen this year or next year. So that's wonderful news. Yeah, congrats to Sarah. She's done an amazing job of making sure that um, they took full advantage of the reimbursements that were available to them. Tom, do you have a question on what she's presented so far? Or you want to wait to the end? or Okay. Okay, so then um, now going on, and that's so we're we're trending on on course there, and even better than we thought for this year. Um, and then looking at next year, uh, what we have in the uh, conference report information for next year is what was released as of April twenty seventh. Looking at that, the FTE is forty three thousand two twenty nine. You guys already knew that it's an increase from where we are right now by about two hundred fifty seven FTE, but compared to where we thought we were going to be, as Mitzi said is about 919 down from our original projection this year. As you already know, the uh, base student allocation is going up 5342. Uh, required local effort millage rate is changing from 3.711 to 3.553. Um, I know Missy already shared those things. So as far as in the uh, salary and benefits, um, we built the projections based upon class size and formulas. And the budget projection includes a 0.5% salary increase contractually uh, for board appointed positions. We always budget as if we are fully staffed, as we should. Benefit projections, uh, the FRS rate, as you know, is going up uh, to 10.82. Increase of medical premiums, approximately 2%. Charter school payments are increasing, but mainly due to the Dreamers Academy being added. And again, then general fund, um, one good thing about another, the ESSER funding is that we have taken out the expense for uh, the textbook adoption for next year for um, saying now it's going to be funded by the ESSER funding. So that has helped us as well. Uh, at this point in time, the ending financial condition ratio for 2021 is 14.92% estimated. And for our next year, it's estimated to be 10.94%. So that's the narrative. Um, we can go over the actual financial information, which is to, uh, labeled general fund revenues and appropriations, that spreadsheet. And just to kind of reiterate the information that uh, from the narrative, basically that's just showing, you know, what our Florida uh, Education Finance Program had for projected actuals, which is the fourth calculation, and then the conference report. Scholarships for next year, we're projecting those to go up. As Mitzi had said in the conference report, it's basing it on status quo, but we know that that's not going to be the case, so we are increasing that as an estimation. Uh, class size reduction was down over $4 million, and the other ones just changed slightly, and uh, not, not a lot. Mental health has increased a slight bit, so, and that gets allocated directly to those contracts. So then on the page two of that, um, as an, in the narrative talked about the course fees for STC, that's the main decrease as far as adult ed, the classes being taken. Child care fees, um, line 108, I'm sorry, yes, line 108, um, we're projecting that to hopefully go up again next year because things may resume uh, more normal. That was down this year. Federal uh, or food service indirect costs on line 99. They're doing uh, so well now that the general fund can actually uh, anticipate to receive some of the indirect costs from that fund. And then, um, let's see, so total uh, or miscellaneous local resources, line 113. You can see that's a big decrease for next year. The main one the reason for that is because this year we were. Um, we had the sonic wave revenue that we got, which is a one-time thing. When you get to line 127, that's the transfer in from capital. It should also have um, slash ESSER to it. I apologize, that wasn't on there. Um, we are obviously, as you guys knew, the ESSER funds are going to be reimbursing us for expenses that we've incurred since March 2020. Um, and to the tune of, at this point, um, it will be transferring in about $11 million for that. So that's what you should anticipate to see for the, for the budget. 
Are you going to combine that with the transfer from capital, or is that going to be a separate line? Separate line. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So then, um, as you can see, overall, um, the total funds available really hasn't changed very much on line 135. Um, so that's good news. Then on page three of that, the this is the appropriations by object, so salary and benefits, as you all already know, um, uh, column N. Like I said, we had, we've decreased, uh, or we're not coming in as what we had budgeted, um, over 100 vacant positions next year. The, num the number you see in column AD is as if it was fully staffed, and I'll, it has the 0.5 contractual in it. Benefits have the increase of the FRS for next year in AD. Um, and for a purchase services charter for AD, you'll see the Dreamers are in there as well. All the other things are, are trending basically, um, or are put in basic uh, zero-based budgeting. So there's really not a lot of changes. Uh, energy services on line 143, though, however, we did uh, talk with uh, FPNL, and we're going to have about a 16% increase in our electric. But uh, the facilities team has done such a great job with so many things, staying on top of uh, inefficiencies and thermal storage and things like that. So you can see that. It's not impacting us the way it, it could have been even in prior years. Materials and supplies has the textbook adoptions in it for column N, but for column AD, like we said, ESSER is going to be able to cover that for us. And for capital outlay, that's not there's not much changes in there. Usually we try to flow things through capital when we can in that regards. And for other expenses, if you've looked at that one on line 146, you can see the projected actuals um, there compared to prior years is due to the Department of Education has asked us to put the PICO or the public education capital outlay from charters from their charter line down into that line. So that's why that's jumped so much over the this year and next year. And that's part of the reason why the um, purchase services for charter is less. It's kind of they flip flopped where they required us to report it. So uh, with that being said, then if you go down to um, the bottom line, I know the uh, financial uh, ending financial condition ratio that actually the percentage is listed on page four, um, which is just this on page four, the information from page three is broken down by function, how the state makes us report. So you can see um, on line 227, the projected uh, actual is at 14.92%. And for the conference report, the 10.94%. Uh, and around July 18th, we will get the, um, the second FVFP, in which we will have to make any changes to the revenue or things that they may change on us. So then we kind of have to flip it in a day or two to get it to you guys for you all to be able to see it and for it to go to the paper. Also, as Missy said, around July 1st, we'll get the certified tax roll, so that will change some things for us too. So uh, other than that, the team's working real hard and um, bracing for what may come, but hoping things are going to be pretty good. So just, just so you're aware, the difference between page three and page four, the numbers are the same total. It's just how you're showing it. What is how you're spending the money, salaries, benefits, and for what you're spending the money on, instruction, technology, fiscal services. So it's, it's kind of taking it and slicing it two different ways. Tom. So a uh, quick, uh, great news about the mental health professionals. That's, that's awesome. And also um, on the sustainability of food service, that is uh, a, a, a big, uh, great accomplishment. Um, you mentioned about the uh, voucher programs and what could, you know, that you've uh, they, that the state has the reserves for us. But my question to you, because it, you know, it all, as always, looks incredible and what incredible work you've done. As you said today, what could go wrong? Um, that there are way more children who return in the state than we actually have reserve dollars available for, or way more vouchers that are. Um, or scholarships, sorry, scholarships that are requested. Um, I'm, nobody really knows how many students are on the Gardner. We've not been able to get that information. 
So we don't know what the impact could be for us in Sarasota County in that area. We know family empowerment scholarships have increased over time. Um, McKay's been relatively steady. Um, so it's just kind of that unknown that we're not sure about um, that is of some concern. Thanks. That's pretty much what I thought. Thanks. And, and it's also, um, you know, if they start out the year in one program and then come back into the public schools, I'm not quite sure how the money's going to follow them. Um, but, uh, you know, that's another unknown out there. Right. That's that's always been a concern if they start at, you know, a charter or a private or homeschooling and they come in after the October count, then we won't receive funding for them for a half a year. And so, but we would still have the cost depending on when they come in. Uh, Jane? And it looks like we're spending a lot more money on benefits. And uh, I think that's something that needs to be discussed with the union when we do negotiations. I know that that's not always discussed, but it is a real cost factor and a benefit to our employees. And I think we need to emphasize that this year because some of these things are out of our control and uh, we need to make sure, I mean, they, that's real tangible dollars. Mm -hmm. And in any business, those would be considered part of the package. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'd like to thank you for your work. Oh, um, we've got some new board members, and me too. I'm, I'm confused. Could you uh, resend us a schedule for when we have to be adopting the budget? Because there's some strange days that we're going to have to show up here rather than our regular Tuesdays and Yes, we can provide that to you. We have to do the um, approval to advertise for the millage rates in the budget and then the actual adoption of the tentative and in September the final. So, and yeah. in, in the past, these meetings haven't taken very long. Of course, the public this year could come out and and have lots of input. Um, so we, I, I just, I'm not sure I have them all on my calendar. So okay. if you could send them to us, I'd appreciate that. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Thank that you. brings us to member comments. Um, Karen? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as Mrs. Corcoran just brought up the increase in mental health funds, I just wanted to uh, p put a few thoughts out there. One, I'm extraordinarily proud of this board for uh, prioritizing the mental health needs in our district. And I know that she looked to um, the um, our district department's um, focus on bringing in mental health counselors. And as a uh, behavior specialist here locally in our schools for a good deal of my career and a principal, um, those needs are, are great. Um, and I want to point out the differences in uh, having our own hired staff in our schools, guidance counselors, behavior specialists, social workers, et cetera, and the comparison between um, those uh, Sarasota County uh, hired and retained and trained staff as to uh, the outside organizations and the uh, turnover that exists in the kinds of uh, consistency in training and practices. And that's not to say in any way, shape, or form that I'm uh, a strong, very, very strong component, uh, advocate, excuse me, of partnering with outside organizations. I I just want to point out from my perspective the importance of having them as the so-called icing on the cake and that our focus is in building our own sustainable, highly trained, quality um, mental health uh, staff in-house. I wanted to share that. Thank you. In, in building on that, Karen, I know that it's been a very difficult week, a year for a lot of our students and for a lot of our staff and and I, I don't know how many teachers come across this but when school ends 
oftentimes even when the break comes up. Sometimes it's just after, at the end of school day. There are children that are afraid to go home. And we heard of a speaker at our FSB conference that was like that. Um, going home was the worst time of the day for him. Uh, summer break is the worst time of uh, year for them. And um, I don't know how many other teachers have heard, but I know one teacher that's heard it more than once in her life, time of teaching. A child at this last week of school tells them, and I'm talking about elementary kids, that they want to die. Um, and I'm glad that, I mean, 10 minutes before the bell rings, you got somebody telling you that on the last day of school. But I'm glad that we had the resources in place that this teacher was able to go to their school counselor and was able to go with their principal and and get the services and, and make those calls, find out that there wasn't the gun in the house that the t kid was talking about, or at least, I mean, that they're following up on it, but that we have, are able to address that. I mean, before not knowing what's happening with these kids when they go home. And, and, and um, I just really appreciate all of those teachers out there um, that form those relationships with those students and um, that reach out and don't say you're on the bus goodbye, uh, but reach out and, and, and do what's necessary to provide for those kids. Um, and hopefully uh, we're giving them the resources. And I know that um, the uh, student ID cards that we're gonna be required to have now will have a crisis hotline for students to be able to call in the summer if they need to. Um, Jane. Well, I have a, a couple of questions for Mrs. Ziegler. I, um, in the last week, have seen um, some columns she has written and or interviews she has given, and, of course, the Fox News interview about critical race theory. And I just wondered if she could clear up the confusion, because I had a number of calls from teachers and schools who were very concerned that she was actually insinuating that we were teaching CRT, as it's now called, uh, in our classrooms. And I just wondered if she has any evidence, a sheet of paper or a lesson plan or anything, that we are doing that, and if, if in fact, she was referring to Sarasota County Schools. Would you like me? Bridget. Thank you. Certainly, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share, and I know Dr. Aspen and I talked about this, so two things. Uh, when I was on Fox News, I was talking in general for Florida, but as it pertains to Sarasota County, I have certainly had ongoing discussions with our superintendent since his arrival, so there are multiple evidence areas, and CRT, as it's often referred to, is not necessarily how it's illustrated in the K-12 environment, but it's embedded in there with its purpose. So I'll take you back to the professional development, which we started the beginning of this year when the board approved $5 million extra added days for training. Purpose was for pre preparation for the school opening under a pandemic. Um, I recognize that that was thankfully pulled. Um, it was under, uh, what is it, cultural responsive teaching. Um, and Dr. Asplin was, came on board and was made aware of it and, and did pull it and canceled a six-figure contract. That's one off uh, scenario that we dealt with. Two would be the other brain pop issue, which had many undertones of not only um, you know, Black Lives Matter, but the systemic racism component, which CRT promotes, and also the, you know, defund police movement. But again, that was supplemental material. Dr. Asplin, again, thankfully responded and created it such that parents, he didn't censor it, which I think was kind of a, um, a common or compromise, but that it would afford parents if they wanted to, to ad address, address it. But I would say we still have a contract with Brain Pop, and not that I'm uh, alleging that any s uh, staff members are um, assigning those kind of things, but if you go on, they still have pretty controversial, I would say, uh, material on there. And then finally, is the as we move forward, you know, I know Dr. Moore did an amazing job, and I'm so encouraged to hear what she's saying, really focusing in on the resource component from an academic standpoint. But as early as Mar April of last 
uh, uh, April of this year, there are members on the committee who have been concerned about the language of implicit bias and all of those, again, undertones from the CRT component. Uh, but again, to Dr. Asplund's credit, he's been aware of those and is striking them. So the reason I bring those up is I don't believe, I believe that Dr. Asplin and uh, the majority, the vast majority of our staff and this board truly are focused on, you know, access to quality education without pushing agendas. That being said, I just gave three areas of evidence of which forces at various levels of this district and outside, um, you know, meaning supplemental, instructional, et cetera, that, are do, that do in fact push this. And I do believe it's a concern. I think that's exactly why the governor did what he did. Um, I was speaking more from a state standpoint, but I do believe that there have been elements and I just illustrated them there. And fortunately, they've been they've been stripped, but I wouldn't, nor would the superintendent necessarily have known about many of these had members of the public not come forward. And so I think that's really important that the governor has made it very clear through the Department of Education that that's not something K-12, um, that they're objecting to that in the K-12 public school environment. And I support that. And I would encourage anyone else. And I think, and I don't want to speak for Dr. Aspen, but if there is something that we're not aware of and that is being presented that's against this component, then we need to know about it. So. That's Thank you. And secondly, you said that you were the only person really qualified to be on the school board because you had a child in this district. You don't have a child in this district. You have a child in a private school, as I understand it. And uh, I have background in teaching. I have children, grandchildren in the school district. So I think to, to say that you're more inclined to be in the know with some of your comments in both the Tampa Tribune and on television are uh, are disingenuous. Do not throw arrows at the rest of us, please, because I think you come from a certain perspective. You think that's the right perspective. I, I have many years of experience around education and in this space, and so I would appreciate it if in the future you did not disparage those of us who do not have similar experiences to what you've had. This is a great school district. And any attempt to disparage the school district is something that really hurts me deeply to the core. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's better if we get things out at the workshop table than just letting things go on and, and in the spirit of attempting to have true communications at the board table. I think this is a very important discussion to have. May I respond, Mrs. Brown? Sure. Uh, first of all, if you could find where I said that you do, or any members of my board don't have the qualifications to serve here, I'd like you to show that because I've never said that. Second, I just pointed out that I am, in fact, the only one on this board with school-aged children. And there are a number of families who have chosen to go elsewhere who love this district who know all of the great things, but it is a reflection oftentimes of the majority of the board that makes decisions that causes those decisions to be made for them to leave the district. And I think it's imperative that policymakers on this board take the time to reflect on that as opposed to trying to throw errors, as you used, to other board members who oppose those decisions. Ms. Rose. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a few pieces. I have to reflect on my role um, as a school board member uh, in the course of this conversation. I think it's, it's very important um, in how that role reflects in uh, my accountability, uh, only speaking for myself, to this community and the students of this community and the staff of this community and uh, the success that not only um, I've employed, but I've observed occur uh, most successfully in our schools, and, and that's modeling uh, what we want. And I know as a principal and the teachers I've had the good fortune of working with, it's modeling solutions um, versus uh, uh, whether you uh, perceive someone to be targeting individuals and or your response to any perceptions are, are targeting. I, I don't see the purpose in that. I see the the uh, success of solutions. So let me bring forth um, my solutions in the course of this conversation. Um, and that is me focusing in as a board member on my own accountability. And if I'm able to do that, I feel like I'm going to provide the most success in the things that I have pointed out. 
and that for our community to understand, because a lot of them don't, um, that our curriculum and our benchmarks are all set forth uh, by the state of Florida, Department of Education, uh, with the oversight of our governor. Um, so we are not um, creating our own uh, curriculum. And as a governing body, um, particularly with uh, the accountability going to our superintendent to assure, which he's done a good job with, um, that we are sticking to that curriculum. So, and the alignment of that uh, to our strategic plan, I would like to see, and I think that a, a strong solution would be to have, and I've mentioned this to Dr. Asplum, to have our adopted materials uh, easily accessible uh, online. Um, the um, whatever we want to identify um, this phenomena as a, the culture wars in our country or at whatever level, the more visibility that we can have in a um, appropriate professional way from my perspective, because it's how I would want a, uh, our things solved in our schools, um, that we make our curriculum very uh, visible and the adoption process that our community is better able to understand it, where uh, the textbooks come from, how, when, where, and why, and what is their involvement, no matter what your involvement is as a community member. We've talked about earlier with uh, Dr. Moore, we have significant involvement, whether it's a, uh, a parent, uh, and of course, we want every family as engaged as possible. We have uh, a lot of involvement from community organizations um, across uh, Sarasota County. So uh, better understanding the benchmark, sta benchmark and standards uh, process, the process of adoption, uh, visibility of curriculum, how it connects to our strategic plan, how it all falls under the uh, blanket of the state, and for Karen Rose holding Karen Rose accountable and modeling that. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I'd um, like to follow up with this a little bit also. Um, you know, I, I we talk about critical race theory and we talk about what we're going to be teaching in civics class. Um, I think that uh, students will bring up in discussion the Black Lives Matter issue and the protests. Um, I would think that they're also bringing up the uh, issue of the January 6th protest and whether or not um, our president was duly elected. Um, um, I, I think we need to let the facts speak for themselves and that um, teachers can allow discussions in their class, but you know, help help the students to focus on facts, uh, not opinions, um, and surely not theirs. And I think as far as our school board uh, goes and how we work together, um, there was a presentation uh, last week that I went to um, by uh, Dr. David Lee. He is an associate professor um, at the um, University of Southern um, Mississippi. And he gave a presentation on the 10 laws of great board governance. And they go, and how do you expect awesome if you're not sure what awesome looks like? And, um, and that you can't out policy bad leadership um, that uh, we have to be careful that we don't overmanage um, what we're doing here. Uh, we hire a superintendent, and we're supposed to work with that superintendent uh, in partnership. Uh, they said that uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, recently, and there's a lot of competition out there and political views that are coming to board meetings now, and now more than ever that uh, we need to work together um, because um, uh, we have to be out there talking and, uh, you know, letting parents know why would they choose our schools, our public schools to attend? Why would teachers want to stay here? Because a great teacher won't stay here if there isn't good leadership at the top. And, you know, I think I use that the boards need to get their arm around things rather than their fingers in it. Uh, they say the data doesn't lie, uh, but 
Um, it'll uh, help you to understand why. That's where you need to go. Uh, and that um, not to expect too much too quickly because uh, there's no quick fixes in education and pointed out that, you know, of the 25 uh, goals, national goals for education of the last couple of decades, none of them have been met. Um, but um, that in order to be together, um, uh, they said ego is not your amigo, um, that we need to be working together, the law of one, one voice, because if our board doesn't work together um, and, and find a way to do that um, and support our superintendent and the goals of what the district is looking for, because it's not our strategic plan, it's the district strategic plan that we have input on and that we'll apport, uh, and I would like to uh, perhaps, if you not get to ask um, Dr. Astman to perhaps contact this person to come and it's it's not FSBA, it's, it's an outside organization come and give us some of the boardsmanship rules that we would help us work together. And in addition to just coming and talking to us one day, he also reviews the um, tapes of meetings uh, to give input on how we do and, and how we react to one another. I, I think that um, it would be uh, in our best interest if we did that so that um, we could get together more, more speaking in one voice about our district. Um, uh, Mr. Edwards. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Brown sort of touched on where I'm uh, most disappointed because I think uh, as a board, uh, we've worked uh, genuinely very hard to uh, speak uh, at, at collectively and to not be divided and not to let politics find its way here. Uh, I know I have uh, worked hard on a personal level to keep politics out. And from the very first time I met Dr. Kingsley, she said, politics does not belong in education. I remember that at our, our first meeting and, and I took that to heart before I declared running. But I'll share with you uh, a quote from our governor, which disturbs me greatly. We're not going to support any Republican candidate for school board who supports critical race theory. And I'm under the impression that it's a nonpartisan race. And when we hear it to the point from the top down and that insinuates to our public that we should be looking at our school board based upon party and not qualifications, I'm concerned. And to be honest with you, um, and I know uh, Mrs. Ziegler will, will know this, that the, she called me to wish me congratulations on my election. And th what I shared with her was that because she had school-aged children, I always listen intently to what she has to say. And here's where I'm the most disappointed. I think that her fight for families, her discussion about families is admirable, but our black and brown families and our black and brown students know that CRT is a dog whistle and what it means. And that excludes those families. And I certainly hope that our election about school board candidates does not include any conversation about CRT at all, locally, because that's political rhetoric. We see it and we all know what it means. So I'd like to put this past week and that weekend of unfortunate reference to CRT behind us and get back to the business of being a working collaborative school board. Thank you. Uh, Bridget? Mine's on a different topic unless anyone wanted to continue to address this. Go ahead. I just, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, 
Chairman. First of all, yes, um, Bridget and I had had um, a conversation yesterday because I was um, concerned about some of the news that came out this past week, and um, we had a great conversation. Um, and I do appreciate what she says about uh, the fact that we did um, block or handle or address certain issues that came up this year, and um, and so I appreciate that. I guess the part that disappointed me was the fact that I understand state issues, state politics regarding CRT. I understand national CRT, but it seemed there were a couple times where it was brought back to Sarasota County. And I, and I knew that um, throughout the entire year, I mean, at the town hall meetings, uh, you know, in our board meetings, we've said over and over again, we do not teach CRT. And for me, it leaves people confused. And I don't want, as a superintendent, I don't want our community and our students and our teachers, employees to be confused. And I did. I received a lot of phone calls about this, said, what are you going to say about this? Because it sounds like they're calling out Sarasota and we don't even teach this and what's going on. And so I feel like, um, you know, I need to mention what's going on here. And and so for it was disappointing to me that that Sarasota was sort of called out under the CRT issue when we have really worked to change some things that happened and we do not teach. It's not in our curriculum. Our teachers are fantastic, wonderful, dedicated, amazing teachers. They are terrific. And they do a great job. They they do, I heard the word indoctrination. They do not indoctrinate our students with their own politics or their own religious beliefs. I just want to make sure everybody's clear about that. They don't. They teach their classes. And in the rare case that that happens, in the rare case that that happens, we address it every single time and we work through it, just as we did those other items. And so I just want to make sure that as we move forward, if we can try to keep the politics out of everything and move forward, because I think all it does is confuse It causes divisiveness. It causes um, distrust among our people because they don't know what's going on now. They think maybe we are teaching CRT, but we're really not. And so I just want to make sure that we have our eye on the right in the right place. And and I I wrote a couple paragraphs here that I just want to I just want to read because there's no other way for me to say it. Um, Just in case CRT came up today, I just wanted to make sure. Plus, I want to make sure that our community understands. Sarasota County Schools, as you know, is a top-rated, high-performing district and will continue to thrive and provide a world-class education for our students. We must not create unnecessary noise and obstacles that hinder our attention to the business of education, which is imparting the critical knowledge of reading, writing, mathematics, science, social studies, and the arts. Perpetuating further discussion that could that could be implied as false narrative about our schools creates confusion, distrust, divisiveness in the community as we seek to positively educate our children. In Sarasota, we don't just want our students to learn. We want them to think critically, applying their skills and insights to improving their lives and the lives of others. The school district's motto for next year is working as one for the success of all with the priority of educating our students, supporting our teachers and staff, and embracing our great Sarasota community. So let's not focus on politics, but rather concentrate on valuable efforts on uniting to provide the high quality education and incredible opportunities that our students deserve. And I think everybody up here believes that and wants that. And I think we just need to, and there's going to be politics. You guys are elected. You are elected and there are politics. We just need to try our best to keep that out of the narrative as we move forward and we talk about what's best for our students so i just wanted to that's just my thought and uh and i do appreciate all of you and and the decisions you make and what and what you do thank you thank you um and and dr lee said the three uh poison pills of school boards is personalities power struggles and politics and and shows us how we can help keep those from our board um on a totally different subject Bridget Ziegler. Uh, I'm just going to, and I I have to respond very quickly. Okay, go ahead. But the fact that I am committed, and I think it's really important 
for a number of reasons, I think Mrs. Rose highlighted areas that I think are incredibly important, and I can only speak as one board member, but my job is to hold myself accountable to what I say and what I believe, and I believe the superintendent has I indicated that, and I do think there's a lot of things that are one-off, and we bring them to the attention, but we can't just say, we can't bring it up because it's terrible, because it'll make everyone bad lo look bad. We have, to, we have to say what we mean and mean what we say. And the other part that I think is really important, and I think that, and I've told to Dr. Aspen, and I've mentioned it to members of the Department of Education, is I think it's unfair, particularly if you think about the brain pop or all of those. We have a lot of vendors that put stuff in there, and we do a pretty robust, you know, um, uh, adoption process, and we have these, you know, third-party content aggregators. I would never imagine our staff to have the time to go through all of that, and I don't think it's fair to do that. And I think that's unfair, but I think there's a reality there that we need to address it. So if you're out there saying we're not promoting this, and whoop, there it is, that hurts. That undermines your credibility and everyone else's. So that's something I will continue to fight for. But um, I, I appreciate everyone telling me their comments. But um, that's where I want to close. But I don't think Brain Pop was. But that's your opinion. It was a civic lesson that it was. And that's where Bra I think Brain we're Pop going to wasn't pushing it. Brain Pop was bringing it for discussion. But again, we add it so that only adults could um, uh, must approve it before it's out there. But Brain Pop does a lot of wonderful things, a lot of content, and you know I, I don't think we should be disparaging Brain Pop. Um, you know, unless we see all of the things that they do. I mean, they do wonderful things, and you disagree with one, but th they've, they've got a lot of very, very good content, yeah, and, I, and I would not want to see it taken from our I schools. I did not speak. I sp I'm talking about, and that's the thing. There are things that I, and I, as a mother of an elementary school student, did use it and do see that there's good, but there is things there are, and you find that a lot, and that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate that it's embedded in there. And I think that's where people get frustrated. And it's unfair to the superintendent. It's unfair to staff that they get blindsided by these. And that's unfortunate. So the only way to make it go away is hold those organizations, those publishers or those companies accountable. Because that's not, I don't, I don't want to put one more iota of things on top of what our staff already has to do. I will close on that. Um, and I don't know that I have enough time, but one of, and I can bring it up at the end of the next meeting, one uh, at, at our board meeting, not the workshop. But one area that I wanted to discuss with the, the board and get a little bit more information on is on the recording of IEP meetings. I know I'd sent an email back in May, and my understanding is for years, we don't have a current policy that addresses this, but it has been the district's practice to allow for IEP uh, meetings to be recorded upon request with uh, ample notice. Um, and my, I have been made aware on a couple of occasions where that has now been de denied. My concern is twofold. As we work to uh, um, strengthen our relationship as we move through the ESC development plans that, that I know Dr. Aspen and team have been working on and restore any trust and faith and communication, that's key. But also, I want to make sure that we're not arbitrarily deciding with one family they can and with another they cannot. We need to have something written, and I wanted to get some information on that, and I'd also make a proposal that we move forward with a policy to be brought back to evaluate that would allow, similar to how Manatee County is, that allows upon request that uh, all families would be afforded the opportunity, as with a district, because we're a dual consent uh, state, that they would be allowed to um, record IEP meetings. So I can discuss that further at our next meeting since it's at 2 o'clock or if you want to move forward with discussion. Yeah, I would think you could carry on your discussion with Dr. Aspen on that. Um, well, I would be bringing it to the to the board to discuss. It's a policy. But I, th I think what would be good is um, if I can get the um, legal language on, on all of that okay. first so that we have all that in front of us, so we can have that conversation. I think that would be the best. Because uh, I know in talking to um, our ESC attorney and our regular attorney about that issue, there is... Um, I don't know if it's statutory, but there is some language written that um, that we need to look at and just make sure that we have so that we can have a good conversation about that. I'm not saying yes or no. I'm saying let's get the information on the table, read it, talk about it. Okay, I just had decide. requested it back in May and still haven't received it, and it is impacting families at the current moment. That's why I wanted to address it. You requested what? information on our policy and how we choose whether or not to allow a family to record or not. It was like well, as it stands now, I can tell you, as it stands now, um, none of our employees are required to be recorded. 
or videoed. Right. Under IDEA, there really is, is silent on it. So it's really incumbent <laughs> upon the district to either make a policy one way or the other. I use Manatee as a, an example. As I recall, when they did that, there was quite a big fight. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's a it's a good it's a good policy because you imagine these are families. They don't really understand all the dynamics. So you have a whole room of people who want to help, but it's emotional because it's your child. So they, this affords them the opportunity to go back and review it. Um, so their policy is that it does allow families to, or you know, parents uh, upon request, the right to record. And that would be the, the policy language I would like to propose to bring back to the board to for adoption. I would think we would have to bring the um, union in on that discussion, too, because I would imagine that employees have protections, and I don't know what they are, but, you know, it's not just, I mean, because that's what we as a board have to do is not just look on one side of the issue. We've got to look at all sides, and, um, you know, that's why, you know, you, you can't just put a camera in every classroom uh, because... Uh, you know, uh, the teachers feel that they have rights, too, um, because what has happened, it, it, they've got that, you know, they've got that, and then they will can use that as a way to get back at one of our employees and what protections does the employee have. And, and, I, and I don't know what they are, and I think we need to look at that. And that was one of the things that I was looking at when a policy comes up regarding um, parents having copies of incident reports. Um, what about that? I mean, because if a parent has a copy of an incident report and or, or an incident a video or all those things, and you've got children in those videos, I mean, there's a lot of other things to talk about than just one parent. I mean, because there's other parents involved, because there's other children involved, and there's other there's other things involved in those. So I would think that when we start looking at video recordings and um, electronic recordings, we have to think about other students involved because oftentimes, as I saw, the, there's something having to do with one of our charter schools. I mean, it, it, it brings in what one child said to another child and you bring in all these other things. And so you have to be careful about what you release to the public on what is being said on those things. It's 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 a tricky situation right. that I think we need to look at all sides. No, no, and I, 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 you bring in a very different, but understandably so, component. I think my my question and and why I, I'm more urgent to do such is that it has come up a couple of times. I haven't really under and my understanding is, and it apparently it hadn't been an issue prior to. And I think you raise a good point on, on the union side if there isn't anything contractually, but. To my, the best of my understanding, and please, I'll welcome anyone to tell me if I'm incorrect, but that it has been Sarasota County Schools practice for years that upon a request that from a family that uh, an IEP be recorded, that they were afforded that right. And so if anyone tells me otherwise. I, I think it, it's the so, difference but, of who, it, who I mean, owns that recording. Is it a recording from the school district that if there's things on it that need to be redacted, or is it a, 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 a recording that parents take? And again, it we would have be, to look at it, all of okay, those things. Okay, so, so, so for clarity, again, it would be that that be, we're a dual consent state, meaning that both parties have to mutually agree to be recorded in any circumstance. As an organization, unless there is language within the union, the bargaining contract, which you raise a good point, I'm not familiar with that, but my only caveat is that I'm understanding that frequently, if not always, up until X point, that IEPs upon request from the parent were afforded to be recorded. So I would, with that, unless something's changed with our CBA, I would presume there is no legal language within our CBA that prevents that, but I'm not going to cite that, that, that it is one way or the other. My understanding is that for years that Sarasota County Schools, upon the request from the parent to record an IEP meeting, was granted. And as of recently, they have not been. And it appears, and I don't have enough evidence to say this, and that's what is a concern, let's catch it now, let's build trust, let's have good outcomes, let's work as a team, but I also don't want arbitrarily us to say yes to one family and no to another, because I think that is also a risk factor. So with that, I think, with all that information, that I would like to move forward with evaluating the policy, but I don't, I mean, and so that families who do request this are, are, are granted that because there is nothing in our policy that precludes that. There's nothing under federal law that would preclude that. And it's, to my understanding, again, tell me if I'm wrong, it's been a consistent practice of Sarasota County Schools for years. You're all correct. Thank you. It has. 
as a principal um, at multiple schools in a district. You, you are recognized, Ms. Rose. Yes. Even though we've got someone else to speak first. I just wanted to validate what she was saying. Uh, well, I, I have a concern about children's names being mentioned in those meetings. Not if the parent did the recording. Uh, Mr. Edwards. Okay, so I'm going to take a step back from the topic of that conversation and say that it's the first time I'm hearing about your issue, even though you said you had it since May, unless I wasn't listening, which is possible. But um, bigger than that, I've had questions for us procedurally. How does something get on to a topic and how do we have that conversation? And um, uh, the way I'm told is that you email the superintendent and the chair and then that go goes to an agenda review. And so I guess, um, and now I'll go back to the topic, um, is that ESE is very important to me and, and all of the processes the same as I believe that we all dealt with mental health. I think we're all equally concerned with ESE. So I would rather see it become a formal topic that gets put on an agenda and that I have a chance as the new guy to do my research and ask the right questions and make sure that I'm prepared to have that conversation. And I'm getting a nod from Dr. Asman as he has said he is going to get the information together. Um, but I know that there is some concern and on my part, who owns the recording? Because if it's a recording that is done by a parent, when there might be other things in the, that we would be redacting if it was ours before it gets public, because I, there's some sensitive information that is on those and we have to be careful of, because there are laws that protect student information. Um, with that, I see no other people pushing their buttons to talk and I'm going to take this opportunity to call this workshop to a close. We will return here at 3 p.m. for our regularly scheduled board meeting.